Okay, let's let's uh, let's roll. So, basically, this is about vertebrate pests, and I'm trying to find now why my little clicker here isn't working. Oh, there it is. I, I lost it in the slide. Okay. So, I like to start out with a quick discussion about how animals have changed, animal populations have changed with European settlement, which basically started in, you know, along the lower Columbia with, you know, Fort Astoria and, and, uh, and Fort Vancouver, some of those kinds of of locations, but basically the populations have changed quite a bit. Some animals have done amazingly well with Europeans coming, and that include the deer have done quite well, the raccoons have adapted reasonably well, um, and the rats, which didn't exist here, both the Norway rat and the roof rat are Eurasian species that came over with the Europeans, so they have done well here there are a group of animals that haven't done well with, with European colonization here in, in North America. Those are predominantly the larger predators. So you're looking at, at cougars, at, at bear, uh, at, at some of the, 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 the other bigger animals like, um, like fishers and things like that. So there's, a, you know, there's been a, a change in the dynamics of, of what's here, the, the different populations that are here. We've also added animals that weren't here before, like sheep and goats and cattle and horses and those kinds of things. So we have, we have changed, uh, changed the dynamic of what is here in the course of 200, 250 years of settlement in, the, in this area. And that, and that populations are still changing. Um, we'll talk about a few that were introduced that were big mistakes a little bit later on in more detail, but some that come quickly to mind for me would be the... Um, would, would oh, my mind is is capsized? Uh, would be the starlings for sure. And so, what's another example of something that has been invasive and was brought in for a fur-bearing animal and turned out to be a big nightmare? Does anyone in the audience know? Anyone want to repeat it to Gary? Nutria. Nutria, big time. Yes, nutria are a fascinating animal that we would really love to turn back that clock on. They were brought in in the you know, early 1900s as a fur-bearing animal, and it was a, a dramatically profound mistake to have done that, along with a lot of the other plants we brought in, like canary grass and things like that. All of them are part and parcel of some big biological mistakes that were made here. But anyway, there you go. So, what I deal with a lot are animals in two settings. One setting is the landscape outside. You know, a beaver takes down a tree. Um, pieces of, of vegetables are disappearing in the night. Those kinds of things. The other whole set is, what is that noise under the house? What is that noise in the attic? What is it? Why are they here? So, thinking about what is that noise under the house or in the attic or in the wall voids, what are some of the species that might be responsible for that? So. Let me hear just some quick names thrown out. What might what might be there? Norway rats. Yes. Bats. Bats. Yes. Field mice, maybe. What was that? Field mice or mice yes. in general? Well, field field mice, not so much unless your cat brings them in and leaves them until they die, because uh, the voles really are not. They don't like like houses. But we do have a native mouse called the deer mouse which is, is definitely here. We also have the European species of mice, so for sure mice. Yes, squirrels. 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 Yep. <laughs> Chipmunks. Chipmunks, raccoons, uh, occasionally opossums, occasionally skunks under houses uh, if they're denning, that kind of thing. So kind of looking at the list of things that I have at least feel like I've accumulated across the river from you in the time I've been here, which is a long time now, Quite a variety of birds, things like sparrows definitely can be there, starlings can be there. I had, I had a call about an apartment the other day, and um, they thought they had a kind of a rare invasive, or a rare bird species coming in and out of the wall void of the second floor of an apartment, that somehow there was a hole in there, and they the birds were nesting in there. And I said, no birds are nesting in buildings that are, that are rare and endangered. Those rare and endangered birds aren't, aren't they wouldn't be rare and endangered if they liked houses to nest in. They were starlings, but they had no idea they were starlings. And um, there were lots of starlings, actually, in that particular place. So anyway, so birds, regular mice, deer mice, wood rats. This is, 
So the native species so far are the deer mice, the wood rats, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what those are later on, uh, the regular rats, the two types, the Norway and the roof rat, and those are non-native species. Ground squirrels are native. Tree squirrels are a mix. We have the Douglas squirrel and the western gray squirrel, which are native, and then we have other introduced eastern gray squirrels and other introduced squirrels that are non-native. Uh, the chipmunks are by and large native. The raccoons are by and large native. Opossums aren't native to here, but they are native to North America. And skunks that we have are native. The little alligator lizards that we have, which can make noise. And, and uh, we actually had an alligator lizard get itself into the electrical panel of a, um, of a heat pump we have and actually get fried in there and, and tear, take down the whole thing. So anyway, sometimes they get into places you don't want them to, but by and large they're kind of neat. And then we have bats and even some insects can make noise. So there's a bunch of things that can be making noise inside a house, but in a lot of cases people don't have any idea of what they are because they are not out and active when people are. They tend to be nocturnal, for the most part, not, not the birds necessarily, but the rest of them tend to be nocturnal. And you don't see them or, or really, yeah, you don't have the chance to observe them unless you're making a real effort to see them. But in the end, why are any of these animals, birds, lizards, why are they in a house? What are, what are the three core reasons they could be in or under a house? Well, for my mice in my family room, it's because they're eating the food that the guinea pig throws. Yes. Okay. So food? Warmth. Hmm? Warmth. Falter. Uh, I didn't quite hear, hear what you said. Warmth. Well, warmth. War warmth or shelter, for sure. Uh, warmth or shelter and water. So those are why they're here. The deal is the animal doesn't have to be getting all those things in one place. They can be getting food in one house, water next door, and shelter at a third place. Uh, and this is not as uncommon as you might think, particularly with rats and raccoons and opossums and things like that. So, um, but the dynamic, sort of the, the, the magic triangle of why an animal is there is food, water, and shelter. And when you start to think about how to deal with that, you're looking at how to in, intervene on on one of one well basically all three of those variables and when i get somebody calling me about noises under a house or around a house the very first thing i ask is are you free feeding a dog or a cat food that can be eaten by something else and the answer is 95 percent of the time yes and so my answer back to them at that point in time is okay I'm going to tell you to do something, but it's going to make you uncomfortable. And what you're going to have to do is remove that food or water. And, and the shelter is a little bit more challenging. We'll talk about that, but basically blocking off where they're getting in. Uh, and we'll deal with that as we go along. But removing the food especially is an interesting effort because you'll all of a sudden see the animal more because they've been used to getting food, and now the food's not there. And they are disoriented, panicked, worried, and they're definitely looking for where the food went. And so you're liable to see them more at times you wouldn't have seen them before because you have broken the social contract that had been existing in their little minds between your, them, the eater of the food, and you, the provider of the food. So dealing with the food is is a big deal and we'll talk about this especially when we deal with rats later on things like that so food water shelter is the, the dynamic some of the concerns in terms of vertebrate pests damage to crops and plantings that's for sure with deer and and birds there are some disease issues and we'll talk about those a little bit with a couple of the animals aggressive behaviors to pets and people that is predominantly around, in my experience, raccoons, skunks in the sense of spraying. I mean, they're not going to bite you, but skunks in the sense of spraying, and um, sometimes rats, actually. And then there can be issues of structural damage to a house that are very, very significant, especially 
if there are species that would be likely to chew through the electrical wiring at a certain point and cause a fire. So those are the kind of core concerns we have with regard to the animals in, in, in and around our house and in our gardens. So some of the diseases of concern, it's not limited to these. In fact, I just had a long call over this last weekend with a person that was concerned about a, a, a roundworm that is carried by, by raccoons. And round, this roundworm actually is fairly serious, but luckily the infection rates in humans are, seem to be relatively low. The risk has predominantly been with young kids picking up the feces of raccoons, getting them on their hands, and then ingesting the, the, um, the, um, basically the eggs of the roundworm in the feces. So anyway, here are some of the diseases of concern. The two that I think represent the biggest issue for home gardeners are hemorrhagic E. coli, which is predominantly either cattle or deer vectored, and salmonella. So that, that's more of a rodent kind of issue. But but they're, all of these have come into play at various points in time. And when I'm working with small farmers, we are talking about all of these kinds of things and, and how they move. So. Um, as I mentioned, uh, cattle are the main carriers of hemorrhagic E. coli, uh, but deer also carry it, and we'll talk about a particular example in Oregon not too, uh, in not too distant future. Uh, manure feces is the main point source, and really most of the impact comes from people eating fruit and vegetables that they don't cook. If you have what we call a kill step, which is what cooking is called in the um, food safety trade, you generally won't end up um, transmitting or, or, or um, ingesting hemorrhagic E. coli. You will have killed it. Um, and then with rodent contamination of stored food, it is oftentimes salmonella. And that one is available both off your hands as you handle the food and also if it's lightly cooked. So that can be, that can be an issue for sure. So this is, as I say, not so good for many reasons. And in my county, as I think probably fairly true in Cowlitz County, there is not a block in my county or a quarter of an acre in my county that doesn't have deer at some point making their pathway through our landscape. So, so in terms of general strategies, years ago when something, somebody had an animal they didn't like and there weren't very many people around, what was happening? You know, say 50, 60, 70 years ago, if you didn't, if you didn't like an animal being there, what did you do? Cut it. You killed it. Yeah, you killed it. Okay. Well, we don't do that so much anymore. And, okay. and so a lot of the management strategies are what I call the send them to your neighbor strategy. In other words, if you physically exclude them from your house, they're going to go somewhere else. Uh, if you physically exclude them from your garden, they're going to go somewhere else. Something like a repellent, which says you don't want to eat the, you, Mr. and Ms. Deer, don't want to eat the landscape material that I planted here because I put a repellent on and it doesn't taste good to you. You are going, they are going to go to your neighbor's property. So um, predator encouragement is a very mixed blessing, and we'll get into that a little bit. But that's not normally a mainstream technique for, for managing some of these uh, vertebrate pests. Non-lethal remo removal, uh, those are the, the live traps, the have a heart traps, are used. We have some in our office that we lend out. The challenge for us here is on live traps, is that by Oregon uh, ORS, Oregon, Oregon statute, you are allowed to live trap, but you aren't allowed to release alive. And I will say that law is violated, or that statute is violated quite a bit, but there is some biological reasoning around that. Well, for example, if you're trapping a raccoon you may then move. So the raccoon is going to have some resistance to, for example, a certain strain of distemper. If you trap that raccoon, and that's the, that's the distemper strain that's in this area that they're in. They're, they're resistant to that. They've lived through it. 
you trap that animal, you move it 15, 20 miles away, there'll be potentially another strain of distemper that they are not, um, they are susceptible to, so they're not going to live very long. And they are also transmitting to the raccoons there the strain of distemper that those raccoons where you moved, moved your, your raccoon to are not resistant to. So there's some interesting biological challenges in live trapping and then releasing live. Um, but but uh, I would say by and large, the reason we live trap a lot is often we don't know what we're trapping. If we have something under our house making noise and we make an assumption that it's A and it's actually B, um, then, you know, especially if it's a neighbor's cat or dog, which are surprisingly common that are making the noise, that then um, non-lethal trapping is, is very appropriate because then you can, you know, not, not be killing it, which, which would be a very bad thing to do. So anyway, lethal removal is pretty well limited to rats and mice and I do understand now in Washington it's okay to do it with with um, with moles, uh, which it didn't used to be. So rats and mice and moles are the big three in terms of uh, lethal removal. What's that? Yeah, it's not the same. What was the question? I think you were just picking up background noise. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So we're going to start out with deer. And like I say, deer are are ubiquitous part of our landscape. So the interesting thing is the deer really do rearrange landscapes. And this was not much discussed until about 40 to 45 years ago when animal biologists, zoologists in the, the um, northeastern, upper northeastern states like Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire began to notice that the fall colors in their hardwood, very diverse hardwood forests were becoming less vibrant, less interesting. And as they got looking at what was going on, they discovered that in these, what had been very diverse, different sets of hardwoods in these forests, often upwards of 15 to 20 different species, that when there was an opening in those forests, a tree fell down and then seedlings start to grow and things like that, that these forests were converting to the six trees the deer didn't eat. And so slowly over time, they were changing the biology of those forests. They were changing the ecological diversity of those forests simply by having large amounts of deer with high grazing pressures. And they started doing some demonstration projects. And so the picture you have in front of you is where they fenced off, you know, like a, a huge number of acres, like 10,000 acres or something like that to the deer, and just watch what was happening between the area they fenced and, uh, where, there, where there were no deer, because they eliminated the deer inside that, and uh, the areas that there, there were deer. So anyway, bottom line is deer do rearrange our natural landscapes. I see this a lot in our own forests here in western, in, in Columbia County, our, our coniferous forests. And our and our um, our uh, small remaining remnant areas of oak oak forests, and that we are definitely losing plants in those systems that were more common 50 years ago. Again, because of very very high deer pressure, we have one extremely rare lily that's down to about 75 known species in its natural habitat in southern Oregon. That they have to protect every one of those from the deer because the deer love that lily. The long-term perspective on that plant surviving in that landscape is pretty bad because unless you really change the dynamic with the deer, you're not going to be able to reestablish a, a population that, that will survive because they love that plant and they're loving it to death. So, and I think that's actually happened up here with Columbia lily. We used, there used to be a lot more Columbia lily up here and I see less and less of it because it is very popular and it is being, re you know, there are plants coming in the deer won't eat. For example, like English ivy and, you know, a variety of plants the deer won't eat into our natural areas, often non-natives. And uh, so they're left left with these plants that they love and they've been eating their whole life. So there's just fewer of them and they're eating them hard. So anyway, 
that's kind of an interesting story on, on deer biology and landscapes. Anyway, around your home landscape, they can do some minor damage. This would be a, what I would call um, pruning for convenience. Uh, they're, they're eating what they can eat there, and it may not make very much difference in terms of the productivity of the tree. But if it were a young tree, that continuous removal of leaves by deer is devastating. So um, this kind of thing, where all the leaves are gone, and people think, well, you know, the limbs are still there. It's okay. You know, it doesn't matter that we've lost some leaves. Well, it does matter because leaves, if you remember the vegetable class, leaves are what drive photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is what builds the carbohydrates that build more roots and build more shoots and builds more growth. And if the, if the, the deer are continually nibbling the photosynthetic areas of that tree or shrub, eventually they will kill it. They will, it will eventually be so stunted that it will die. So, um, yeah, deer, deer nibbling is, is not insignificant if it's continuous. In, in fact, when people ask me about planting an orchard, the very first thing I ask is, so how are you going to keep the deer away from it? I don't talk about varieties at that point. I don't talk about anything but how are you going to keep the deer away. And the reason for that is I've seen people plant five to $800 worth of trees and lose them all in two years because they figured, well, there's enough here for the deer. No, there's not enough here for the deer. The more you have, the more they'll come. So uh, anyway, and this is, you know, deer nibbling, nibbling in a vegetable garden, not quite the same thing, but still significant. And then it it's collides with the, um, the uh, hemorrhagic E. coli issues. Uh, this is deer nibbling in a nursery that I worked in or worked worked with, and and uh, these trees now on are totally unsaleable. The ones that have been nibbled back and growing in ways that aren't going to make them a good tree. They're turning a maple tree into a maple shrub, and that's that's not going to sell to anybody. So, yeah, no, no not good. Um, conifer damage. We we see a lot of browsing, but we also see antler rubbing on young trees. There's there's browsing on the top and we'll talk about how the forest industry has dealt with that in a little bit but but basically uh once they get a little older this kind of damage here is is antler rubbing and it can it can be serious but it's not as as persistent as stunting the trees by by grazing down the tops so so this was one hemorrhagic e coli event we had in oregon and it was in 2011. It was a commercial farm uh, producing strawberries near Newburg, and the deer were allowed free reign in that forest or in that uh, in that planting in that uh, strawberry field. And basically, they were apparently quite contaminated internally with their little bodies with um, the bacteria that causes hemorrhagic E. coli in humans. And so they, in their droppings, they just drop them around. And of course, strawberries, you really can't wash a strawberry very easily commercially before you put it into the box to sell because they deteriorate very quickly. So typically we don't wash strawberries at all. And because this farmer was selling to a lot of people that had those small local strawberry stands all over the place, it was getting into a huge population of people that they couldn't find even. They, there was no way to trace back where these, where these strawberries had been sold and who they had been sold to. So uh, it wasn't like Fred Meyer getting a notice that, you know, you've got some strawberries with hemorrhagic E. coli. Well, they can, with their, assuming it was paid with a credit card, um, they can trace back to everybody who got those strawberries because it's part of their... Um, part of their system in terms of knowing knowing you know what you purchased and so they can tell you if you bought these within the last two weeks you have to throw them away that kind of thing so anyway this was a big deal this was a wake-up call for our farmers although it's not been easy to deal with so from a home garden standpoint could you have a deer resistant landscape yeah you can the problem is that whatever set of lists you look at the one thing you have to remember is that it doesn't mean the deer never eat them. It means that they don't eat them to oblivion, typically. They don't. And so I'm going to go through a couple of lists of native plants 
that I think by and large, for the most part, deer don't eat and some vegetables that deer don't eat. But I will talk about a few where that's definitely not always the case. So starting out here, again, deer resistant gardens, they're nice to look at, but most of the time the deer resistant materials are not ones we eat. So here are some things that they maybe won't eat. So winter squash plants, I still feel that they are somewhat deer resistant, but we did a planting in Klatskanai a couple of years ago, and we had a deer fence up there, and we were we were doing a basically a study of which which tomato varieties can grow best in an area that is shorter season than the rest of Columbia County. And so we wanted the space inside the deer, deer, um, the deer fence for that test and for a few other plants that deer really did love. So we figured we'd plant some winter squash plants on the outside. Well, the deer who had the year before eaten green beans that we had planted on the fence, and so they were used to coming there for food, they decided, well, if you're not going to give us the green beans, the winter squash will be just fine, and they took off after them. So there you go. But I think in general, they're not as likely to eat them. They don't eat potato foliage, and they don't eat tomato foliage, but they love pepper foliage. And how do you account for that? They will eat they will eat figs. They will eat fig leaves at certain points in time, but they won't eat them again to oblivion. They will eat some. But I would worry if you were planting a fig tree outside a deer fence, I would worry about protecting it for the first couple of years until the tree got bigger. Persimmons, they don't seem to eat um, persimmon leaves or persimmons themselves. And I know that's not widely grown, although I have a couple of master gardeners who are avid persimmon growers, and, um, and it is actually a, a fruit that does very well here. And then for a long time, before we put up a deer fence at our property, I grow you know, eight to nine ty types of garlic every year. And it's a long story as to why. But anyway, um, and it, before the deer fence, I grew the garlic. And did I tell this during the vegetable class? Did I tell it? Well, anyway, I can tell it again if you, if you missed it. Anyway, nine different varieties of garlic. One year the deer came through, they ate one variety to the ground, and they left the other eight. Why? I have no idea. I can't explain deer in the end. They are somewhat profoundly inexplicable. So here are some things though I'm quite convinced deer don't eat and that's because we have all of these growing outside of the deer fence and we've never seen any damage. So uh, rosemary, thyme, oregano, marjoram, mince, catnip, lavender bay, those are pretty darn safe for deer so I, I wouldn't worry about those. Here yeah, is where I get go, go ahead. Um, Alice put uh, there was a there's a website that shows deer resistant ornamental plants and Alice put that website up in the chat if people would like to look at it um, and then I had uh, one person respond said they have had deer browse on potato leaves oh they have okay so there you go another one's off the list <laughs> yeah I know they love potatoes if if they ever get the idea that they can pull that up and find the potatoes in the ground it's all over um, but um, yeah. So here again, these remember these lists are they're they're flexible and a little bit does depend on individual deer behavior. But generally, th this set of plants I don't think they're liable to eat a lot of. Um, wild hazel though is interesting because right behind our house, I've been trying to remove some wild hazel underneath some Douglas fir for. Um, it, basically to give some more light to some um, um, ocean spray. But anyway, what I've noticed is when I cut the wild hazel back, they are actually eating the, the leaves of the shoots fairly readily, but a mature wild hazel plant, they won't eat the leaves that they can get to on that. So I don't know. Um, in, interesting, interesting thing. But they don't tend to eat vine maple uh, particularly. I've, I'm pretty confident of that, or a red elderberry. And they don't eat cascara. Indian plum, they don't seem to bother. Uh, so some of these red flowering currant, I think they bother some varieties. And this may have to do with in sort of the breeding or selection uh, process for red flowering currants that maybe 
there's been there have been some varieties that were selected that have less of whatever it is that tends to tell deer not to eat it. So uh, so there are some varieties there I think may be eaten. They can nibble on fresh salal leaves, but won't won't do salal. You can't kill salal basically, and you can't kill Oregon grape without a lot of effort. So uh, and nor do nor would you want to in most cases. So. Um, Nutka and bald hip rose, they don't seem to eat very much, at least in terms of the leaves. Uh, wild strawberry, they don't, they'll eat the strawberries, but not the, not the leaves much. And then lupin or sword fern. So those are some that I think are fairly deer resistant. And some others that I think in general are the native columbine, maybe. Uh, our beautiful iris tenax is a, seems to be a deer resistant plant. Our oxalis, our trilliums, they'll eat the, tr actually they will eat the trillium flower sometimes. Uh, wild ginger, I don't think they eat. Um, Ceanothus, they do eat, and I think it's varietal, but I'm not always sure. I've only grown a couple varieties of Ceanothus, so I don't know how much they will eat and how much they won't, and whether they need, depends on what their choices are, potentially, there. So, um, and then coyote brush, uh, we visit a place of the coast that has quite a bit of coyote brush, and there's a lot of antler rubbing, but I don't think that the deer are eating it, but they're really messing with it by rubbing their antlers. So, and then they don't seem to bother manzanita or madrone or bearberry very much. So I'd say those are relatively safe. Um, what else do we have here? And I think we have some ornamental. Yeah, so here are some other plants that, again, I think they're largely deer resistant, uh, but none of these are native plant materials, except for there's some rhododendrons that are, the native rhododendron is for sure. And I, I really don't think they eat that uh, very often, if at all. They do eat azaleas, your, your, your uh, evergreen azaleas. They definitely are fond of those. And so they will, they will eat those. They will, they will prune them into little balls, just like you've been doing. You know, yeah, they, they will eat those quite a bit. English ivy, sadly, they won't eat. And the challenge here is that we would love them to eat English ivy to kind of change the dynamics of that plant. In England, the English deer eat English ivy. When English ivy got here, our deer will not, which is, which is really too bad. So really, really too bad, actually. We would love to have them as an ally in the fight against that plant. So anyone have any questions about, about these generally safe on deer kind of thing? Yes, no. Um, let's see. Deer browse leaves. Native deer brush is a um, winter staple in Jackson <laughs> County, Oregon, for deer. Yeah, n deer brush is a Ceanothus. Yeah. Is is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that yeah. came from somebody else. Yeah, it, it's it should be pretty. It, they're saying it's deer resistant or deer susceptible. Um, they have, let's see, I can't tell. Okay. I, I, would, yes, I would argue. Nat with Native Ceanothus, deer brush Ceanothus is a winter staple in Jackson County, Oregon. So, yes, they're eating them. Oh, well, they're eating it here. See, you know, it's interesting. I, don't, I see Ceanothus about once a year here, that, uh, that, that, that deer brush once a year here, uh, Ceanothus uh, velatinus or something like that. Anyway. Because the seeds only seem to germinate after somebody's burned something, so a slash pile, uh, especially somebody that's not a, uh, it's not a, um, a commercial operation, a, an industrial forest, but a, but a, a small, a small woodlands forest where they've done some logging and they're burning some brush, and then sometimes those those uh, Ceanotha seeds that have been sitting there for anywhere from fifty to seventy to eighty years just pop out of the ground after that burn. It's really quite astonishing um, and that's that's when they get brought in because nobody's seen them for a long time in that space so anyway that that's interesting okay so on roses historically the rugosa roses are thought to be less deer brows but I would not guarantee that because some of the cultivars are very deer sensitive and others are not so anyway um, you can look you can look at the deer resistant plants but look at them with a grain of salt and be and be prepared to if if it is being bra grazed hard, that then you have to think of other strategies for that plant, whether you keep it or not. So, anyway, 
So in terms of fences, for temporary fences, uh, I've seen people put up, you know, 20 to 30 pound or um, even heavier fish line, and it works for a little while until the fawns manage to wiggle their way through. And then once the fawns do, it's over. You know, it's over. The, the, the does will find their way in. So it can kind of work. One variation on this theme has been to put black plastic at the top and at the bottom with the notion, you know, clipping it with, with either clothespins or whatever, but clipping it to the top and the bottom. And deer will typically not jump over something that they can't see what's on the other side. And that actually represents the value of these six feet fences with a six foot gate. That if you can't see through to the other side, deer are generally reluctant to make that leap of faith. So, um, so these actually do work pretty well. They're expensive and they're high maintenance, but they do work, I think. This is a pretty fancy fence, but uh, using welded wire, and this was actually in a, in a southern Oregon town where the deer are everywhere in that little, in that town. Um, so, yeah. And this is a commercial, what, we, what I call a commercial or conventional western Oregon deer fence. This was around a large, a large uh, commercial nursery. This was 50 or 60 acres of um, mainly trees that were being grown for, for sale as, as landscape trees. And the, these are mostly seven feet tall, sometimes with a strand or two of barbed wire on the top. They're pretty expensive to install. They, you may lose a little bit of crop area when you install them if you were a commercial grower. The biggest issue that I found with them, the two issues that I found with them is you can't forget to close the gates. And then if there is a swale in that, land that you've got the fence going across and there's a gap of more than six inches the deer will attempt to wiggle their way underneath that fence and they actually can do it so you have to be you have to review those areas and see what you can do to block those up after you've uh, after you've tightened the fence so uh, but that's that those kinds of fences are work well and actually do represent the, the most common type of deer fence put up in, in my county uh, for home gardeners as well as for, uh, for farmers if they need them. So electric fencing is much cheaper, but not useful in towns. You cannot use these electric fences in towns, but if you are in a rural landscape, the electric fences, if you manage them well, they will work generally pretty well. They don't work when the power's down, and deer seem to have an incredible sense that the power is out and may do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Some people have used what I call the Minnesota zap fence technique, which is attracting the deer to the fence with some uh, tin foil rubbed with peanut butter. Uh, you turn the fence off while you're putting it on, and then you leave it. So they basically get aversive conditioning that this fence is hot. You don't want to you don't want to test it. So, but by and large, I think these things do work pretty well, or they can be used. The electricity can be used to adapt to an, an existing fence that isn't low. So this one on the left, you can see something that's called poly tape that's running on the outside of the fence, and this can be a pretty decent deterrent for deer where there is an existing fence behind it that they would otherwise jump. So it's worth looking at. The one on the right is something called um, uh, electro fence, and it's basically uh, a mesh that, that can be electrified. This is often used with, with uh, sheep and sometimes used with poultry management uh, when they're grazing poultry. So anyway, these are, these are both possibilities for homeowners. And these are just some more fences. And the one on the right here is a, an electric fence that has been used for years by a kind of a high-end nursery that's located right on the edge of my county in South County called Joy Creek Nursery. And this is their one of their perimeter electric fences, the one on the right. So, yeah. And do, do any of you have electric deer fences? Anyone in the audience have, have any? Yes, no? Okay. 
Okay, so now let's look on the next level of management. This is called repellents. And basically, um, repellents started getting some big time attention back about early 19, early to mid 1950s, when Weyerhaeuser was getting really serious about how they manage their replant areas and they were getting higher and higher deer populations. And they were finding that the deer were turning their, what they hoped would be a nice, beautiful Christmas tree shaped conifer that would be free to grow and be eight feet tall in a short period of time, were turning into pin cushions by deer grazing at the top. And so they started looking into things that, that would work. And they ended up with a product that became known as big game repellent. And big game repellent is basically the label telling you the active ingredient says putrescent egg solids, which is rotten eggs. And so this rotten egg mixture turned out to be a pretty darn good deal. And what I describe as the rotten things repellents really are the core of our repellent arsenal, if you will. So we'll talk about those in a little bit detail in a second. The bitter and burn material, capsaicin, which is in uh, hot peppers, uh, or quinine, uh, which is in, in um, tonic water, for some reason, our, the East Coast deer are sensitive to our West Coast deer doesn't bother them at all. Isn't quinine also a malarial treatment? Yes. Yeah, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but but it, it has that those those quinine based repellents have not seemed to work out here at all with our black tailed deer. So anyway. Some people in my county, because they, they have jobs at the zoo, can bring home cougar scat. This is not a good idea. Cougar scat does communicate. It communicates to the deer. The deer will stay away from cougar scat. The problem is it's also communicating to the cougars you didn't know you had. And it's bringing those cougars to your yard to try to figure out what cougar has come into their territory. Because cougars are not friendly to other cougars once they've got a territory. So you do not want to bring cougar scat to your yard. And um, yeah, you, you just don't want to do it. So. There you go. Some people have used coyote scat um, or coyote urine, which you can buy. Um, you, amazingly so. We can sell anything here. Um, but uh, you, you can get coyote urine, but that will also bring coyotes. So as long as you don't have cats around that you care about or chickens or whatever, that can actually rearrange the deer population some. So it is, it is possible to, if you don't have the dogs or cats to, that the coyotes would, would enjoy eating, then you, you, can, uh, you can use that. So in terms of using repellents, uh, like with this deer away early and often, so what happens is the female deer during her late gestation, which is in February, March, April, her, just like with livestock that are gonna, gonna calve or lamb at that time, um, their protein needs, their what we call total digestible nutrient needs go way up. And so they are moving around, browsing and testing all sorts of plants in your landscape. And they have an incredible ability to say, this is the best plant for me at this particular moment. And so they will eat that plant really hard because its TDN and its, desert, and its protein is, is very high at that point in time. And so they're very good at sorting that out. Uh, so you've got to use your repellent like deer away early and often in the springtime because what you're trying to do is change their behavior and send these deer to your neighbors to eat. Um, so that's, 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 what you, that's what you need to do. You've got to pay attention to that. So some of the ones that work well, I think, Bob X is a, is a rotten plant or rotten uh, solution material. I think it works really well. The deer away works really well. The liquid fence, I think, works really well or pretty well, and it's a it's a repellent based or rotten based material. But this not tonight deer repellent, which has got a great a great name, um, but it is at best average to below average. And the interesting thing about that particular product is it's the only one that is allowed to be sprayed on something that you would eat during the year, 
during during the season that you've sprayed it. And so I think in getting it to be sort of more biologically inert, if you will, not not possessing any microbiological challenges if you were to eat it, um, it's also made it less effective for the deer. So I've not felt that not tonight deer is actually very good, but Bob X, Liquid Fence, and Deer Away are, are excellent. I've also found uh, in talking with people and some personal experience testing that uh, any kind of milk that has, well, milk even without um, being... Um, um, turn sour actually seems to be a halfway decent deer repellent and if it's turned sour it seems to be even better so don't throw it away if you've got plants you want to protect because I actually do think it works and people have made their own sour milk and egg mixtures straining it and put it you know putting it in a sprayer mixing a little water with it and, and I do think it, it actually has some impact so um, I wouldn't use it on food crops but on ornamentals yeah it's not it's it's it, it would be harmless to try. So. so can you confuse deer? Well, they're pretty smart, much smarter than people give them credit for. Tuning a radio to the most objectionable talk show host or music that you know isn't useful. Lights on a motion detector, not useful. But sprinklers like this one that are tied to a motion detector are okay, except that deer are smart. And so typically these, these, um, these sprinklers are set in kind of a, like a, a, a covered wagon arrangement, protecting what you want on the inside. But the deer, if you don't do that, the deer can come down through the side that the sprinklers aren't um, activated on and get inside and eat. And I have a friend at the coast who had these, one of these things set up, and it was a very steep slope behind. He didn't think he needed to do it. He didn't think the deer would come down. And he watched the deer coming down and then slinking on their knees to eat in the garden so they wouldn't activate any of the other sprinklers. So I, they, they can work, but, um, but yeah, you've, yeah, yeah they're, it, they're, they're mixed. Has anyone, anyone here used these and had, had good results with them? Anyone? Yes, no? Me? Nope. You used, I used one on the neighbor's dog years ago. I bought one. Uh, the dog kept coming into our yard and uh, doing its business, and it worked. It worked. Okay. Well, but I think not a deer. Yeah. Yeah. No, deer, deer are smart. Yeah. Deer really, truly are smart. Okay. So we're going to go from big eater above ground to an interesting species below ground. So anyone have any last questions on deer before we move forward into moles? Hey, those blood cake things mm -hmm. that they go in the little plastic things, the deer stayed away from them, but they would, you know, get to a certain parameter and eat. Is that common? Yeah, actually blood meal used to be used a lot in, in it was given out by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and little, um, um, cloth mesh bags that you could hang in your trees like Christmas ornaments. And as it gets rain and starts to do, do some more fermenting, they, it actually does work. Uh, blood, blood meal. And some of, the, some of the deer repellents that you get have blood meal as part of their ingredients. Well, they say you can't smell them, but I swear I could. Oh, you can. You can as they start fermenting. Yeah. Uh, Interestingly, I most of these ones that, that have like the putrescent egg solids, you can smell it. But it's not it's not intense after after a very short period of time. But the deer, so deer, deer have a, apparently a tremendous ability. Well, so do we have a tremendous ability to sell, smell sulfur, which is a breakdown product of proteins, a breakdown uh, release of a, of a of a particular element in proteins uh, is sulfur, and so it's a, it's it's a representative of something rotten. So just like we are concerned with high sulfur smelling things because it indicates we're eating something that's potentially decayed and might be harmful to us, deer also seem to have that same sensitivity to sulfur. So some people have actually felt they got some results with lime sulfur um, as, as a spray. And you have to be careful on lime sulfur at, at the dilution rate you use it at. We do use it as a, as a fungicide, for example, an apple scab. But um, it is potentially 
a deer repellent. And there's an old fertilizer called Milorganite, which is sewage sludge from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, why we'd spend all that money to bring it out here, I don't know. But, but some people have felt dusting that or putting that around plants gives a sh at least a short time cycle of deer repellency around that particular plant. So yeah, some of this is still a work in progress. There isn't a perfect one out there yet, but the perfect one would be one that would repel the deer that you could eat, eat the fruit off of, for example, in that growing season. And right now we really don't have that. But there's room for innovation yet. So anyway, onwards and upwards to, to moles. So the first thing I want to tell you is moles are not rodents. They have sharp earthworm slashing teeth. They rarely eat plants. They're really eating grubs in the soil and earthworms. Those are the, the things that make them happy. Those are the things that uh, drive them to do their tunneling. Because when they are tunneling, they are creating the aisles of their grocery store. And they're basically feeding and it, at the edges of the tunnel, in essence, about to whatever they can get. And, as, and if they have lots of earthworms and a very rich um, bunch of food to, that they like to choose from, they'll kind of slow down their tunneling. And they'll slow down their tunneling when the soil is super saturated, like in January and February. But then as the soils begin to drain out, they will start tunneling more again to again create new aisles for them to do uh, foraging and feeding in. So anyway, that's kind of kind of their pattern. And sometimes if we get an odd week in January that it's dried up for a week, you'll all of a sudden see mole hills and then it'll start to rain again. You won't see any more for another, you know, month, month and a half sometimes. So anyway, the pattern is really based around the energetics it costs to, to dig into that wet ground. And it's much harder and costs them more of their precious body fat to dig in wet ground than in a little bit drier ground. So they, they use their energy wisely. Anyway, mold damage, excessive aeration is the main one, I think. Well, one of the main ones, and that's the tunneling. And on a shallow rooted plant like a um, blueberry or something like that, if their tunneling is extensive enough, you'll water the blueberry, but the roots aren't actually able to gather that water very well because they're not surrounded by dirt in significant areas. So they're not holding the water next to the roots enough for it to really work. So that you can actually see, 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 you know, rhododendrons or blueberries or some of those shallow rooted types of plants, woody plants, you can actually see them wilting because of mole tunneling. And the trick there is just to punch down the tunnels and start watering again and try to catch them all, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, the real problem that I run into with gardeners is mole tunneling in their vegetable garden, especially if they're using some kind of a drip irrigation system or soaker hose or something like that. Because when you're using that soaker hose, you're having a zone of wet and a zone of dry, and you're planting in the wet zone, but that's exactly where all the earthworms in that garden area are being attracted to, too, because they like to be in that wet zone because there's more biological activity offering them easier stuff to eat that they like to eat, which then brings the moles to exactly the same place. And so they will tunnel right underneath your, your tomato plants or your pepper plants or your lettuce, and it makes it very difficult for you to maintain the right soil mixture. So where I am least tolerant of moles on my own property Although I can't say I'm 100% effective, but I'm least tolerant of them in the vegetable garden. That's where they cause problems, and, and that's where I really feel they, they need to be not there. Um, in the rest of, you know, we have, we have a fair number of acres, but in lots of the rest of the part, I'm kind of interested in moles, actually, and I think, they're, I think they are interesting, and I don't begrudge them some, uh, some opportunities. But anyway, so the mounds are irritating in lawns, that's for sure. The other issue with moles is that those tunnels, if you've either caught the mole and there's no, there's no mole right there at this point in time, uh, the tunnels still provide access for what we call field mice, also known as voles, and they do most of the plant damage that you see, you know, eating the bottoms of the carrots, eating the bottoms of the beets, those kinds of things. Often they'll use the mole tunnels as a way to access the places where they're going to eat, and I think that's a big deal. And so people, especially that they start going to no-till gardens, if they haven't figured out how to control the moles and the voles, that no-till garden is going to have some challenges for them over time. Uh, and it, it will get worse rather than better. 
because one virtue of rototilling is that you break up a bunch of tunnels and that doesn't solve the problem always but it does reduce the problem and i do know a few people that are trying to do no till or, or low till but they will routinely root, um, do a deep rototilling in an area that's about four foot wide all the way around their garden once or twice a year to try to keep things coming in from from a field adjacent to a garden or something like that so anyway kind of thing so looking at the difference between gopher and mole teeth uh, you can see that these are not rodent teeth these are insectivore teeth earthworm eating teeth they're sharp teeth no doubt about it versus a gopher which has classic rodent teeth now my understanding in Calais County because I had to look this up a couple of years ago was that you do have gophers as you get into the Cascades, as does Clark County. It was interesting. I was just talking with a farmer from um, from Tillamook County, and I had historically thought they didn't have any gophers there. And it turns out they do in the upper edges of the Coast Range, uh, in the upper Trask River area where, where he was farming. So anyway, there, there are some pockets, but, but um, in, here in Columbia County, across the river, we don't have any gophers really, except if you go over the hill and you might still be in Columbia County, barely right where Skyline Boulevard is going over into Washington County or Malone County, you all of a sudden start picking up gophers very quickly. So, but, but most, of, most of Columbia County basically has none for reasons that nobody's been able to explain to me. So anyway, I think you can now use traps in Washington so we'll talk about, in terms of mole management, um, we'll talk about some of the tools. So when you are, if you're going to trap, and these are clearly not live traps, if you're going to trap, you're looking for a runway that's straight. And these runways can be, depending upon your soil type and, and kind of the, the biological activities in your soil, these, these tunnels can be down as deep as a foot and a half or two feet even sometimes, although rarely, but most of them are within six to 12 inches of the soil surface. So that's that's pretty typical, I think, for, for your county and my county. And they can be very close to the surface sometimes. So what you're looking for is a, is a tunnel that is going straight across, okay? Because what you're gonna do if you're using what I call a scissors type trap is you're gonna put these jaws straddling the tunnel opening on this side and the tunnel opening on this side with this trigger plate in the middle there right on this little pad of earth and this is all going to be worked up so that the, when the trap springs it can it can close easily and it's going to be worked up over here but this is going to be a little tighter because what you're trying to get the mold to do is that you want it to come through here and then push up this trigger plate pushing it up if you push the back of it up the front goes down and then it releases the trap to spring shut and catch them all. So this is kind of the way they're set up. And you put it in, the safety is still on here. The safety will get flipped back. And then you might put some dirt around it or you might not. Some people prefer to do it that way, other, other people don't. Then you're gonna put a bucket or something on that so nothing else can get into it. And then you're going to leave it, and then you're going to look at it every, even a co every couple of hours, or at least every day. And if you see it sprung, like on this lower right-hand picture, that indicates that perhaps a mole has been there, but it doesn't necessarily mean you've trapped it, because it's possible that you found this tunnel, but maybe down below there's a tunnel that's going the exact opposite direction this way, and so they're in that. They might hit this trigger plate, but because the trap is set to go this way and, and capture moles coming this way, it won't capture a mole coming this way. It will just go right underneath it. So anyway, it can be frustrating sometimes, but once you get the hang of it, these do, these do work. I do have a few people that like to live trap moles, and I have accidentally live trapped a few moles in my time. And by live trapping, it means the trap sprung, but it caught them by the little tiny tail they have, and they're perfectly alive except for being kind of pissed off. And so I have actually regularly taken them down a canyon on our property and into an area of deep, um, 
uh, Big Leaf Maple and Doug Fir Forest with a, a nice canopy of beautiful leaves and worms underneath and just let the mole go. And it's amazing to watch how these moles just disappear under the ground like a submarine disappears into the ocean in less than 10 seconds. It's just dig, 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 and they're gone. It's pretty cool. It's way cool to watch. Everybody should have that experience. I wouldn't say it's a bucket list thing despite the picture, but um, but nevertheless, moles are interesting, and, and I think a lot of them. So anyway, but but basically the idea of live trapping is sink sink a bucket they can't climb out of right at the edges of a tunnel that's going straight across. And if they push their way in and they're not terrible, boom, they go down. And these do actually work for a few people. You have to dig some holes and change your locations and stuff like that periodically, but they actually do kind of work. So absolutely. They're really amazing. And, and you know, interestingly, biologically, even though there's a couple of books that have quite a bit of information on moles, there's still a lot that's not known about them. Um, I mean, they're very territorial. We know that. I mean, the moles hate each other. And, yes. um, you know, people watch mole fights. So, so basically... Um, I guess I didn't go into this. Mr. and Ms. Mole are not a long-term relationship. It's a very short relationship. And, and then Ms. Mole kicks Mr. Mole out of her tunnel system. And she goes about building a cavity in this kind of volleyball shaped underneath the, um, underneath the um, soil, you know, underneath the ground. And she goes up on top of the surface of the ground and gathers all sorts of succulent vegetative material. And you say, well, she's just doing that to have provisions to eat? Well, no, they don't eat that stuff. What she's doing is building a pile of succulent material that starts to ferment or compost. And when it composts, it gets warm, and so she has her babies there. And because she has to go out and eat constantly, basically, she's going to be gone. She can't keep them warm, so the compost keeps them warm until they're a little bit bigger, and she can give them enough milk, and they're kind of... They have their own furnaces going at that point in time, if you will. So, so anyway, it's a very clever little system uh, about about keeping um, keeping them safe. But the mole's biggest point of vulnerability are, first of all, in those after about thirty six days, she says to her babies, "Boom, you're out of here. You're no longer welcome in these tunnels. These are my tunnels. You can find your own tunnels." They go on top of the surface of the ground. And they look for a place to start tunneling that isn't occupied by another mole. And they are, at that point in time, extremely vulnerable to the hawks and the owls and the dogs and the coyotes and all those kinds of things. And I see bird kills of, of what I think are hawk predominantly, but bird kills of moles where you can see the talon marks, but they don't eat anything. They don't eat anything at all. So I don't know if it's just practice for them or what. And you rarely, if ever, find a mole skull in an in an owl pellet um they just they just they will catch them but they don't eat them so um you know there's some mystery there um it's illegal to use the body traps to uh to grab to, to use and kill moles or to capture moles um unfortunately the traps that chip says they're the only ones that really work well um the other ones that you might see where they drive spikes into them or things like that they just don't work, um, and they're kind of dangerous. You really don't want to mess with those. Yeah. And as much as I've heard that it's illegal to trap moles that way, uh, nobody's going to come on your property and bother you as long as you don't present a public hazard. If you've got them around a schoolyard or something like that, right. somebody might start to question it, but otherwise they're not coming to look for you. Right. Yeah, I, you know, I never did understand how you could have that harpoon and basically, it functions by puncturing them, but it traps them, and I'm sure they don't die immediately. I mean, how is that not a body trap? I, yeah. I don't get it. I think it's a schizophrenic thing. So, so um, Oregon had that same body gripping trap thing, and it failed in Oregon because people, it had the same restrictions against trapping moles and gophers, and Oregon said, no, we... Well, if and I think it actually would have passed if the same exceptions that had you know you can trap rats and mice in Washington you can still body trap them but you can't trap the moles and gophers and I think if there had been the exceptions for moles and gophers in terms of trapping as there were for rats and mice I think you know everyone would have lived with that better but um, yeah. anyway that's that's the way it goes okay there is a mole bait 
Um, and I think this is, I'm pretty sure this is available in Washington. It does, they're, they're, the baits are kind of shaped like an earthworm. They smell like an earthworm. And I think that they have some activity. I'm still not sure because it's really hard to do a randomized test to prove whether they work or don't work because moles are so spread out and, and you really don't know where they are and you don't know if overnight, you know, something else has gotten the mole, like a, a coyote or something like that. So it's really hard to do a test on these things and, and testing with moles in captivity is, is almost impossible. Um, but, but anyway, I think the early mole baits, I don't think work very well because their material was had to be fed on for more than one feeding and because moles are moving around their runways all the time i think it was those those baits were beginning to decay before moles ate enough of them and and i think in this other one if they grab the earthworm or some people have been cutting them in half they grab half that earthworm maybe they work um i wouldn't say they don't i i i think there's a possibility they do work so some some things you can do that don't involve trapping or, or anything like that. If you're building a new raised bed and it's wooden sided and the sides are taller than six inches, before you you get the bed finished, put um, expanded, either expanded metal or welded wire uh, with holes less than a half an inch, like a quarter of an inch holes on the bottom of that raised bed. Uh, it needs to be something that'll stand. It won't rust easily, so it could be it could be uh, paint coated. It could be um, it, it could be stainless steel, that kind of thing. But anyway, put that on the bottom of the bed before you turn it back onto the soil, and then put the soil on top of it. The advantage of this technique is that the roots of the plants will go through that, uh, and the moles and the field mice typically will not be able to get through this. However, if you have rats, the rats potentially can get through it. So. Anyway, some things that don't work, I mean, occasionally you get uh, gassing and flooding works as a mold control, very rarely. There was an idea that Wrigley's Juicy Fruit gum, if consumed by a mole, and I don't know how anyone ever knew that they consumed them, uh, would gum up their system, so to speak. Uh, that's, that's an urban myth. Uh, there are these mold plants called euphorbias. They're also called gopher plants, where the target animal is the gopher. I think they may be a little bit, a little bit repellent, but I would not argue that they're significantly enough repellent to work. And so uh, they're also quite dermally toxic. And kids, there's a latex that can cause huge, huge skin symptoms and eye symptoms. So I don't, I don't like them in the landscape, and they can spread actually. So I don't think they're a good plant. Sharp objects, I have known of people, have people that have used like prunings from cane berries or prunings from roses or things like that and stuck them down the mole tunnels. And I do think that that may change their behavior, but what it probably does is just pushes them to make a parallel tunnel. So I don't know. Cat feces down mole tunnels, I think those do communicate, but it's a human health issue, so I wouldn't suggest that. We did years ago somebody experimented with what are called essence of weasels and weasels are a mole predator but there's not many weasels anymore anyway um an essence of weasel is a mole repellent actually a significant mole repellent the problem is that a you don't want to raise weasels for their essences um you would have to raise too many weasels uh, b the i think the hope was originally to synthesize that smell and that apparently turned out to be hard to do. So that has never been commercialized. And then the sonic devices do not seem, in my experience, to work at all. And what I found is, you know, like some people will believe anything, and if they believe the sonic devices work, they make excuses for why they don't work. So if they don't work in the first two weeks, then they say, well, you have to have them for two weeks later. Um, I, I just, I don't, I've seen too many places where you put the sonic devices in the ground, and the mole mounds tend to show up almost immediately, and I mean, there's no seemingly any deterrent at all. So maybe someone's had a different experience, but I don't have much much faith in the sonic devices, and they're quite expensive. So we do have something called a shrew mole, and also shrews. So they they are actually insectivores, just like the mole, and um, yeah. 
but they don't do any any major damage like like moles do in terms of tunneling. So I'm going to quickly go through pocket gophers since we don't have them here. We're, we don't need to spend any time on them. The only thing I want to point out is that people will tell you they have gophers, but the mounds of gophers and moles are very, very different. So the, these on the left picture here, these are mole mounds. And you can see they're more or less volcanic shaped, whereas the gopher mounds are more or less crescent shaped. And usually there's an earth plug right in the center of it so you can kind of see where the hole is so you can see the crescent and you can see the plug usually with, with uh, gopher mounds. So another way of looking at it that's very familiar for us is I described the mole mound as Mount St. Helens before the eruption and the gopher mound as the Mount St. Helens after the eruption. And that gets the point across pretty well to people if they see the side view of it. So. And, and these are, again, these are just some more pictures of some gopher mounds. So just so you know, because you, if, you, if you go somewhere else where they have gophers, you'll be able to tell the difference. If you move somewhere else into where there are gophers, if you remember this crescent shape and the plug kind of thing, you'll be able to tell the difference. Gophers are far more destructive because they eat all sorts of plants, roots and bulbs and tubers. And, and yeah, they're, they're, they're tough. They're really tough, tough animals. Just be thankful you don't have them. And so I'm just going to kind of skip through these. And this is the kind of damage they can do. They're, they're serious. Serious, serious, serious. This is, yeah. And this, this plant was, nobody knew why the tops were all of a sudden um, dying from lack of moisture. And typically on an actively growing plant, if there's a, a moisture shortage, it often shows up on the newest growth. Well, this pine was clearly doing what they call flagging. And uh, dug up, they found out it was flagging because the gophers had eaten all the roots. That's not helpful. So in terms of, of getting them, with gophers, actually, there are more options. The cinch trap is widely used for gophers. Uh, we do use them for moles as well. So anyway, the cinch trap works well. There's also, also things called gopher gassers because their runway systems are not as vertically diverse as they, the moles are. And there are gopher baits, which they will take and are toxic. So Anyway, those are the options with, with gophers, and they do work pretty well. And there are some many, many dogs who find it their pleasure in life to, to uh, dig into the ground and get gophers. So many farmers have dogs that have uh, great capacity to consume gophers. So one odd little story for you is that when the French trappers first got to an area below Portland, um, near uh, near St. Paul in that area that they were looking for food and obviously they, they had some deer and they had other things but they found gophers who had been feeding intensely on the wild onion and wild garlic had for their tastes um, the flavor was quite good for them and so they ended up seeing the gophers as more than survival food but actually a high quality food in that location back in the 1840s. So there you go. So this has just been a peculiarly good year for voles, or what? But but definitely, um, definitely the size have been been. Anyway, these are what are called field mice or voles, and they're very very common in Western Oregon and Western Washington. Um, they're cute, kind of. They have, um, well, as you can see in this one before, they have very short tails. They are not climbers. They have no ambitions to be inside your house. They, they are just outside in the fields. They are also the food for so many different animals, it's unbelievable. But anyway, looking at them, there, there they are. There's several species that we have here in Western Oregon, uh, Northwest Oregon. Anyway, these kinds of holes that you see in this lower right picture are typical bowl holes. They can be kind of silver dollar size to a little bit bigger. Oftentimes there are bare areas around them, but not necessarily always. But if you see a hole like that, most of the time it's going to be the field mice or voles. Like another picture there. Anyway, so here's how the, the voles get along in life. First of all, they have an incredibly high reproductive rate. They are actively breeding at about 16 weeks of age. They, um, their numbers are averaging in Western Oregon. 
relatively low, 25 to 100 per acre. But we've had actually, and I should change this, we've had measured um, vole populations upwards of 5,000 per acre in certain conditions and certain times. So um, the numbers can really explode for reasons we don't completely understand. We know we have ups and downs in the population, but we can't really tie it to any particular food they're getting or anything else. There's a possible working assumption that there are some diseases that we don't quite know about yet that may make a difference, but it, it's just not clear why we have such a cyclic um, issue with voles in the Willamette Valley, but we do. They don't hibernate at all, and they're active day and night. So they are full-bore energy little creatures. And what we see are predominantly in our, in our gardens and landscapes, gnawed roots and barks of trees, and we'll see uh, rodent tooth marks and all sorts of vegetables. We'll see more bark damage right after periods of snow, and there are definitely, they prefer what I would call the rose family, which is apple, mollus, prunus, cherry, you know, those kinds of things, roses themselves. And then there's others that they seem to have a particular love of, and emerald green thuya is, is another one. So it's a landscape hedge tree. So anyway, and edges of fields, if you've got a garden, are often worse um, areas because they're coming in out of the, the field where they may have some protection and coming into your garden and maybe using the, the mole tones that we talked about to, to get um, access. So looking at some things, you'll see this after a snowfall that they've come up and just gnawed off the, the trunk of this particular plant. This is vole damage, vole damage here. So it's once you've seen it a few times, you get pretty used to recognizing it. it it's rarely more than six inches above the surface of the ground unless there's been a real snowfall and they've come up and then they can go up really six inches above the top of the snow snowfall. And somebody talked about their potatoes. So this is uh, one of our master gardeners. He was uh, at one point the uh, county surveyor for Columbia County, retired recently. And he finally figured out after we spent some time with this class, what was eating his potatoes. And he became an intrepid vole trapper. And he decided that he could trap his way out of it, and he actually has done a pretty good job. He pays a lot of attention to it. He does trap the moles. He does try to reduce the mole tunnels. And, but he's found these little Victor um, mouse traps work pretty darn well on voles, and that's what I found myself. This year, I had an interesting little problem. I had an early planting of, of spinach transplants underneath the row cover. I think I talked about this in the class, actually. And it turns out a couple of voles were coming and eating the spinach uh, leaves of the transplant. I put it in a trap, got one the first night, got the second, got one the second night, and that was the end of it. So um, sometimes you can solve a problem. So part of the management of voles is to keep the cover down to aid predation. There are lots of things that make their living eating field mice. And so, so keeping, keeping areas around, for example, fruit trees. When, I, when people want to plant new fruit trees, I say, keep that area mowed as tight as you can because the more grass you have growing there, the more they have cover for them to move around and feel comfortable in that landscape that they can do stuff without being eaten themselves. And so they, they, they will work through that and do that. We've had real issues with landscape fabrics and sometimes with mulch with voles being protected underneath that. The most classic one I've seen related to a, um, a person who had a bunch of roses on a bed and they had landscape fabric and they cut holes in the fabric to put the roses in and then they put a little bit of mulch on top, but that was pretty much irrelevant and they had a, a soaker hose underneath. Anyway, the field mice had gotten underneath and lo and behold, in a way that he had no idea was happening, they were eating all the root systems of those roses. And when he came to do some pruning in right about this time of the year, I think it was mid-November or something like that, he started pruning and these roses just started falling over as he touched them with the, you know, the pruning shears of you know, the Falcos and, um, and just started falling over. Well, he, he dug it out and figured out, yeah, this is field mice. You know, that was what was going on. And we have been growing a lot of blackberries not blackberries, excuse me, uh, blueberries in Western Oregon and commercial uh, farms in Western Oregon. 
And the organic growers in particular, one of the challenges they have to contend with, they're, they're using this system more than the, some of the conventional growers uh, because they have more challenges with weed control. One of the things they have to contend with are the field mice that are getting in and working on the uh, root systems of the blueberry plants. So it can be, those kinds of things can be uh, a challenge. So anyway, I do like these Victor traps. I do think they work pretty well. Um, you can use either the ones that are the classic wooden snap trap or there's some that are uh, plastic, but I think they, those work just as well too. So um, one technique, I think maybe we talked about this in the vegetable class, where you dig a shallow trench and you put something over it and you put an apple or something like that in it or you put the trap with some peanut butter, but don't, don't uh, set it first if you don't want to. Anyway, you'll see if the voles are there. And... Um, but I didn't worry about practicing on the spinach one. I just set the trap and um, with the peanut butter and got the bowls. So, in terms of anticoagulants, uh, the first generation anticoagulants, which are really the only things available to you much now, is that um, they need to be fed on for multiple times. They have less issues with secondary toxicity than some of the second or third generation anticoagulants, which are much hotter. And the only way they're toxic to non-target animals is if the, uh, if the non-target animals directly get the baits. So sometimes the voles will move, like mice will move, based on safe locations. So you do have to be aware if you're using these toxic baits, there are potential consequences, and you need to know. The other thing we've got a, we got an issue with for home gardeners is that, to the best of my knowledge, there is not a vole bait that's out there that's legal to be used more than 50 feet away from a structure. And so if your garden's further away than that, technically it's not legal to use. So, yeah. Anyway, these are bait stations, and these can be used for rat baiting or mice baiting, but um, again, you need to be very, very careful if you're dealing with these baits at all. So I go back to my, my original concept on this field mice thing. Keep the cover down, destroy as many mold tunnels as you can, and do some trapping and see if that makes a difference in your landscape. Anyone have any questions about field mice or voles? Okay, I'm going to skip that for now. So we do have some predators that are very active. Obviously, the barn owls we love, the red red tail hawks, and the other hawks are very great uh, field field mice predators. So when you ever take apart an owl pellet, which is 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 very interesting to do, this is the regurgitation that an owl does to get rid of instead of going through a digestive system all the parts that it really doesn't want to try to digest, which are the bones the skulls, and the fur, and they just open up. Um, and if you have a barn owl and you have a barn, you have owl pellets there, and you can let them dry for a little while, or if you're not too squeamish, you can start taking them apart right away, and, and you'll see all sorts of amazing things in there. But basically, it's 99 field mouse skulls to the remains of anything else that you'll find in it. They are just uh, enamored with, with field mouse skulls. The interesting thing is the kestrel, which is a sparrow hawk, is also, actually also a vole hunter. And Mr. Vole um, pees around the runway he's in, and the pee attracts the female vole. But the weird thing about it is the pee is, can be seen under UV. It has a UV fluorescence, which the kestrel can pick up. So Mr. Vole is peeing to attract Ms. Vole to mate, and Mr. or Ms. Kestrel is looking at that activity and saying, I don't see mating, I see meals, and boom, they're on it. So Mr. Vole has got a tough role in life. It's, it's not an easy one, for sure. Anyway, here are coyotes, and this is a picture actually taken in Washington um, by an, an excellent nature photographer. So. Anyway, they do a lot of a lot of rodent control and field mice control a lot. Uh, coyotes do. That's what they're mainly after. Does anyone want to talk about coyotes in towns? 
because I have had quite a few calls both in our communities and from, from people in Portland about this. Um, the biggest issue is they're here, they're very smart, um, their major prey besides rats and mice are cats uh, and a few birds and they're very smart. They're very, very smart and it's very difficult to manage them in cities because the lethal techniques that you could use in a more rural area more safely you cannot use in cities or towns. So I don't know, is this is this a conversation worth spending any more time on or not? It's uh, one of the experiences I had, my son had broken down in Portland and this was two in the morning and so as I'm traveling to get to him I'm downtown Portland and a coyote started running next to me down one of the streets. Oh, absolutely. Finally, he veered off and went that way. But, you know, this is downtown Portland. There's nothing around. And, and uh, it almost surprised me to see something uh, that way. But, yeah. Oh, no, they're, they're, everywhere. they're everywhere in Portland. They're absolutely everywhere. And my, one of our sons used to live in the St. John's District in Portland. And he would come home sometimes very, he was, you know, he, he has a regular job, but he's, he does, he's a musician some too. Anyway, he came, he, it's not, was not uncommon to come home at one or two at night, and it was not uncommon at all to see coyotes in, in that area. Um, no, they, they are everywhere. Years ago, there was a fascinating thing that was shown on NPR, maybe 15 years ago now, or maybe more, called the Wolves of Bucharest, Romania. And, I mean, it was about a town that had no idea that they were, populated with wolves every evening. <laughs> so, there you go. Okay, so, yeah, basically the main thing that you can do to reduce the coyote population is to reduce the prey bait, which is, which is if you can reduce, keep your cats inside and, um, and reduce the number of rats, which we'll talk about in a second, that can make a difference as to where they are. But there is a lot of food for coyotes to eat, and they're very, like I say, they're very, very smart. And they and like there's complex chicken. breeding stuff going on with coyotes too, in terms of in terms of other species. So yeah. Um, somebody mentioned that how coyotes like chickens. Um, yes. And one person mentioned they have a livestock guard dog now that keeps the coyotes away. Yeah, livestock guarding dogs actually can be very efficient on on coyotes if they they have to be trained to do it, or no, don't have to be trained to do it, but they have to be kept as a dog that sees himself or herself as a sheep and and or with the flock in other words so you know it's not something that you, you pet a lot or you know the managing of those things is but if, if done right uh, they can be very efficient um i can sometimes they'll coyotes show up in awful groups and that can that can be complicated too so so coyotes coyotes are darn smart um, they are they are really really smart animals. So anyway, how many ground squirrels do you have, Gary? Do you have quite a few of these or not? Or uh, not so much. No. Okay. Then I'm not going to spend too much time with them. We have quite a few of them here. We didn't used to when I first got to Columbia County, and I they are very common in the Willamette Valley. I grew up around them. They were called gray diggers there. And we call them gray diggers here, but but uh, when I first got here, there were almost none, and I couldn't figure out why. And I got looking into the extension literature in our office and the, some of the history of what had been done, and there was a, a tremendous poisoning program on these ground squirrels in a period from about 1938 to about 1965 or 70, somewhere in there, and then it stopped. And so I think the population had been really pushed down, but at the same time that the baiting stopped, the, um, and there were good reasons to stop it biologically, as we know now, but, but anyway, it was the same point it stopped was the same time that some of the areas that they had been in, in, in farming situations, had begun to be converted to kind of small farms or rural residential. And I think people didn't realize that they were potentially a problem in certain settings, but anyway, so the numbers have increased and we're back to not a huge population, but we definitely have them. And I get, I get quite a few calls every year. So some things that people misunderstand a little bit about, about ground squirrels. 
First of all, they do live in the ground, but they can climb trees, but they don't spend their life in trees. They're not, you know, being in trees is not their favorite thing. They have a, a tremendous food range. They'll eat, you know, succulent vegetation, they'll eat seeds, they'll eat insects, they'll eat roadkill, they'll eat roots. They leave all, leave, um, there's all sorts of things they'll eat. The weird thing is they also go into what we call a summer estivation when it's really hot, which means they go dormant for a period of time, and you don't see them for two or three weeks, and you think, what the hell's happened to those, well, those ground squirrels? Well, they've gone dormant if it's been 90 degrees for a couple, three days. They they just head down, down into the ground, and come, don't, don't show up. They also do hibernate in the, in the winter. So... Um, I think the biggest damage they do for us is really not plant-based, although they can damage some trees sometimes, but I think the holes and the tunnels they'll build can sometimes undermine things. I've had people that had decks where they were maybe a second-story deck and there's a, you know, there's some concrete base and they're, they're, they've gone under the concrete base and, and made it un unsafe at that point in time. So that's probably the biggest issue that I see with them, but, but I do get quite a few calls about them. And uh, so the same kind of thing with, uh, that we talked about with uh, uh, field mice cover, or field mice management, reduce the cover because coyotes will eat these things, and they do catch them. Uh, coyotes definitely can catch these things. And some of the birds, the larger birds, uh, the red-tailed hawks will catch them but uh, there are some bait issues, and you have to be really cautious if you're doing baits. Um, so, and they are not easy to trap, although you can live trap them once or twice, but you can't live trap six or seven of them. So, and the numbers can build up really quickly if you aren't really paying attention or if there isn't much predation in the area. So I don't think I'll spend much more time on ground squirrels, though, unless somebody really wants to. So, here's another question. Rabbits, yes, no, Gary. We have had very few years with rabbits, except that two years ago, we had, two or three years ago, we had about a two-year outbreak of the brush rabbit, which is the little one on the, on the right. And have you seen that much in Cowlitz County or not? I mean, we had, for a couple of years, a lot of them. I mean, it was a situation where it was the first time they'd ever gotten into our garden, and then they're gone again. So yeah, we used to see a lot of rabbits. I don't know that I necessarily see less now, but but there's a lot out there. Okay, do people actually fence their gardens for rabbits or not? I've seen some that do. Okay, okay. Well, we'll talk about them a little bit. Um, this was this is a funny story that's going on of sort of social psychology. So Cannon Beach is is a beach town, but they've had a bunch of rabbits that have gone feral, and so there are these bunnies everywhere. And I got a call from the city manager of Cannon Beach saying, "So what do we do with these these rabbits?" And I said, "Well, you know, I think th sooner or later the rabbits will be taken care of by the coyotes, and if you just leave them alone." But th it turns out there's a the the town is somewhat divided between the rabbit haters and the rabbit lovers, and they are hamstrung as to what they're doing. So I think eventually it'll be up to the coyotes to settle the issue, but there you go. So, so we, we can definitely have uh, rabbit damage in, in, uh, in landscapes. Um, they'll eat almost anything in your garden that you would like to eat. They'll eat a lot of succulent weeds. They are semi-territorial. They do like dense cover. They love to be underneath blackberry vines and things like that. They can they can have their their uh, burrows and things like that there. Uh, they do definitely have cyclic populations, and then their predators are coyotes, bobcats, some very um, aggressive house cats can can get them. Weasels, dogs, you know, larger hawks, eagles, cougars, and then disease. That's kind of the the main way I think their their management takes place. So we do think that some of the repellents that work, like deer away, the rotten egg-based mixtures, um, may work. But if you're trying to fence them off, you've got to go either fairly deep into the ground or you've got to apron that ground out, that fence out from the base of the fence out about 18 inches to get it to work. And it's got to be a rabbit-proof type fence style. So that will slow rabbits down. So this is... 
This is um, uh, an added rabbit fencing along with this, this hot wire that we showed you earlier, but they added some rabbit fencing there. And this was some rabbit fencing that went down and it was pretty tight. And this is some rabbit fencing that is sort of working, but sort of not on, on the lower right there. And then, I don't know, is this rabbit deterrent? The uh, person who took this picture thought it was. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a way to, to reuse something that might be thrown away, and, and maybe it makes a difference. I don't know. So I guess the bottom line for me is that if you have rabbits, the fencing is probably... Uh, long term a good investment and the aproning out is easier than digging deep so but your everything has to be aproned out and your your access into the garden has to be done because these rabbits aren't stupid they will figure things out so it's uh, just a, the comment I have one person said plastic fencing does not work I had a lady that had a CSA and she had a forest on one side of her and the rabbits would come in out of the forest so she built one fence between her and the forest Nothing on the sides, just that one fence, and the rabbits would come up to the fence, see it as a barrier, and go back in the forest. They didn't take the chance to look around the edges of the, of the fence. Well, that's and that amazing. worked really well for her for a long time. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's truly amazing. Well, that's great. I'm glad it worked. Okay, so on Chip, to Oh, yes. What does aproning out mean? Aproning out means your fence, you know, your, your vertical fence comes down to the ground and then makes an L shape then on the surface of the ground out eight, out 18 inches. So Only on the surface, so you don't have to dig at all then. Huh? Or you don't have to dig down. You can go out 18 inches, and then they aren't likely to dig underneath that all the way to get. They want to, if they're going to dig, they want to dig right where that vertical fence comes down. And if, that, if your fencing comes out there as well, you, you've L shaped it up when it hits the ground. That, that will help quite a bit. Thanks. You bet. Okay, beaver. Uh, we love beaver. We're OSU, of course. Um, we're beaver believers. Um, there is such a thing as a beaver deceiver, but I, I won't talk about that. Uh, it, it's the way we can manage beaver dams with beaver still behind them without them flooding roads, but it's a, it's a complicated story for, for people that uh, have the time. Anyway, uh, beaver damage can be very annoying. This is a, a, a Japanese maple that is not long for the world. You can see that. So anyway, the, the creek was over here, and, and it just came up. And they, they can move sometimes upwards of a quarter to a half a mile away from their water source to, to feed. So it can be a challenge. What I see most of the people in my county doing is protecting individual plants that they value that the beavers seem to like. And we have lots of conversations about what that, what that is. And there are a few things they don't like. They don't seem to eat spruce much, and they don't seem to eat cascara at all. But uh, by and large, a lot of native plant material they will, they will work on. They love... They love willows, although if you plant enough willows, the regenerative capacity of willows along a creek uh, can often outrun the, the vigor of the beaver. But we have had issues with restoration projects in Columbia County, and I think the challenge has been we're doing too small, small an area each time we're doing a restoration. Instead of doing like three or four miles along a creek, we're doing maybe, a, you know, we maybe have, we have access to a quarter of an acre or a half an acre or something like that. Well, oftentimes we're putting in perfect beaver food, and unless we do a lot of kind of maintenance and management along the way, it's, it's, it's really tough. But the thing is, we want beaver. We definitely know that they are a key part of the management system for re, you know, regenerating our coho and steelhead and some of those runs. So we, we do want them in our creeks. What we don't want is the damage we're seeing here from a homeowner, but what we really don't want our roads washing out, or you know, and so that's when it gets a little bit more complicated, and that's that's a longer conversation. But but that's where the beaver deceiver can sometimes come in. So anyway, um, plant trees they don't eat again. It's a pretty small list, and not really. I don't think we know that much about it. Uh, protective wraps on trees, though, we do a lot of that, and that's those are mainly wire wire based wraps, and you do have to make sure that they can't come off if it's an area that's prone to flood that they don't they can't come off in a flood going downstream that, that wouldn't necessarily be good um, for a variety of reasons so 
In Oregon, and I don't know if this is true in Washington, beaver are now considered a nuisance rodent and can be lethally removed without a permit um, unless you were going to take the fur. If you're going to if you're going to take the fur, then you have to you have to have the the, the license to take a fur bearing animal if you're actually going to salvage the fur. So. Anyway, we, we do like beaver, we'd like to keep them, and uh, we'd like to find a way to live with them better than we have in the past. So, so this is another animal that's very interesting. It's called a mountain beaver. And another name for them is boomer. These are not beaver. They're a whole different species. They are native. They eat predominantly miner's lettuce, sword fern, branches of young fir trees, but they can climb up into a fir tree up 15, 20, even 30 feet to get the tip ends of the branches, which is what irritates the forester, uh, because they'll take the, the leader out. Uh, and there's some ornamentals, and I don't know if I can show it. I have a little video, and maybe if we get to the end of this with a little bit of time, we'll, we'll go come back to it, of a beaver, or of a mountain beaver, um, Working, uh, working a hardy fuchsia, and taking away the fuchsia branches, and it's being it, it's taken from a deck outside of Seattle by one of our master gardeners who had a, a, a daughter that lived in Seattle, and caught this mountain beaver in the act. And there's actually quite a few things they like. They really do like um, the tip ends of fuchsias. They like, or not the tip ends. This one was taking branches that were two and three feet long, dragging them with it. And they like uh, the rhododendrons, a fair number of the rhododendrons. So anyway, they're kind of, uh, they're kind of, um, you know, they can they can do some landscape damage. Although I don't think it's it's not the kind of damage you get with a beaver tree, with a beaver taking down a whole tree. These are taking just pieces of of things. So it's it's um, it's less less of a challenge. I actually think these are very interesting. I know I, I work with people that it just drives them crazy. They have something that's nipping the top off of any of their fir trees. But I find them interesting, and I get, I'm thinking they're probably playing a more of a role in the forest than you would think they are, because they, they like to be they have their tunnels under, like, really old-growth logs that have dropped down. or You know, they're, I, I think they're really interesting animals, and I would not begrudge them their time here. Um, that's, that's my view of it, personally. Okay, I guess I took out the Nutria pictures. Hmm. Maybe I didn't. We'll see. If I don't come to, I, if I don't come to the Nutria, we'll talk about them later. Um, so, on to rats and house mice. So, these are a significant set of questions that I get. And we have two different mice here. We have what's called the European house mouse, which again came with European immigration to North America. They brought the mouse with them, as well as the rats, the do rats. Uh, initially, they were native to India, but they basically followed the spread of agriculture in the Mediterranean and got to the rest of the world from, from kind of the beginnings of agriculture. So a lot of these rodents, we have kind of made them what they are because by creating a food source for them that's concentrated in one place, if they can find shelter around where we are, and then the plenty of food, they do really well. And so in third world countries, they can certainly damage crops. They don't do it so much here, but as I mentioned, um, you know, they, they can, they can do that. They can spread disease. They can damage uh, the wiring in houses leading to fires. So this is why we don't want mice in house houses. And then they are actually a, a, a carrier of uh, toxoplasmosis. And toxoplasmosis does a weird thing to, to um, both house mice and voles when they get it. And that is that it makes them unafraid of cats. And weirdly, so it changes, actually this, this particular disease changes their behavioral patterns. And there are some other diseases that do that as well, interestingly. And there is some idea that then... It changed some behavioral patterns in cats, and then cats gave it to humans, and it changed our behavioral relationships with cats. So there's a long um, NPR program some years ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, on, on cat domestication and the role of toxoplasmosis and that whole 
range of things that's worth listening to. Very complicated biology. Anyway, so house mice, just like field mice, mature six, day, six weeks or so. Um, can breed all year round if it's warm. They communicate with pheromones, so smell kinds of things and ultrasonic communications. Really strong senses of smell. They're pretty darn good climbers. They use, though, and this is important, they use existing holes. They cannot make their own holes like rats do. And mice and rats do not get along. So typically, if you have rats, you won't have mice. Um, but if you have mice for a period of time, you can have rats and then you won't have mice. So anyway, they are easy to trap, though, whether we're talking about mice in the garden or whether we're trapping about, um, oh, whether we're trapping about house mice. They are easy to trap. They are, they place their bet on reproduction and not a lot on thinking. And so you can trap mouse after mouse after mouse in the same trap and they never figure it out. They really don't. But the core of both house mice and house rats is exclusion. And so you want to be doing, if you're starting to begin to have problems with either of these two species, doing some look at where they can possibly be getting in and doing everything within your capacity to remove those openings. And we'll talk a little bit about that more when we get to rats. So the mouse that we have most commonly, though, in my county is not the European house mouse, but, but it is the deer mouse, which is a native species. And the, the deer mouse is actually quite cute and big ears, underbelly that's white, uh, a white a white line on the bottom of its long tail. Anyway, they're really interesting mice, actually. And they have similar behavior to a house mouse. Very easy to trap. Exclusion is, again, the main deal. But one of the issues with the deer mouse is that it's the only known vector of the hantavirus. And the hantavirus actually has been found in Cowlitz County. Um, and it there was an outbreak, I think, two years ago in um, East King County of some hantavirus in infect infections that were caused by inhaling the uh, viral particles from the feces. So, so it's definitely around, and it is a serious disease. This hantavirus is a serious disease. It's still about 40% fatal, even if it's diagnosed early. And again, you have to get it by inhaling the viral particles, not from licking them or some, you know, having something that's on your hands and somehow you eat something and get them in that way. It doesn't work that way. You have to inhale them into your lungs. So this is why it's generally suggested that if you're cleaning out an area that has a lot of mouse poop, you should use either a wet mop or you should use one of the vacuums that has a... Uh, you can put water in, and it, it drops it into the water. So um, anyway, uh, so far, I don't think we've had any in Columbia County, but I do think we've had a case in Washington County, which is right below us. So anyway, does anyone know of anything more about coronavirus in, in western Washington? Anyway, okay. Well, anyway, it's a good reason not to uh, not to have these mice in your house. So, in terms of looking at um, issues with rats as we're moving into a different dimension, public health problem, no doubt, vector of a number of diseases. They can disrupt natural systems, and we'll talk about that, particularly with the roof rat, direct injury by biting. They do the same thing field mice can do. They can damage electrical wiring and cause fire. The difference is rats are too darn smart. They are really, really stinking smart. And so your control techniques have to be um, more diverse. And um, yeah, and so we'll talk about how to deal with them. So a couple of the uh, rats that we have, and they were they first showed up in Oregon. The first sighting of rats on the, on the land in Oregon was Astoria, which obviously came off the ships and um, found a home. So anyway, they're the largest of our rats, the Norway rat. They're adapted to cooler climates. So they can be found basically almost all over the world. They, they can be in every state in the United States. Um, they're well adapted to urban environments. I spent two years, many, many years ago in Washington, D.C. 
And the only two real animals besides humans and birds that I saw were these Norway rats and raccoons. I mean, they were, these things were everywhere in that environment. And in a project that I was working on years ago, part of it involved doing some community organizing around having a community responsibility for reducing the amount of food available to the rats and beginning to get a handle on the damage rats were doing to people uh, in, in these urban environments. And it was, it, was, uh, it was very fulfilling work and it actually made a difference. But, uh, it, you know, so really rats are a village problem, if you will. So anyway, um, they're omnivorous, they're also okay. Well, I would wear them versus nothing, for sure. But I really would try to do, although all of us probably, in, unless we've been living in a very sheltered environment, have probably cleaned up something that had had um, had uh, 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 deer mouse droppings in it and done it without a mask and done it with a vacuum. And so the incidence is not high here. Um, it's interesting in Washington and Oregon, both the incidence goes up as you get into eastern Oregon or eastern Washington. And also as you go south on the west coast into Utah, Arizona, uh, New Mexico and those areas, the incidents, and, and even down into Northern California, Southern Oregon, and into California, the incidence goes up very much there as well. Yeah. Um, is that a is that a um, correlation between uh, water and or the you know the moisture and and uh, and that or? Yeah, I, I think it probably relates a little bit more to some of their food sources, but I don't know exactly how that how that relates completely. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not totally sure where that is, but there's, it's definitely more common. It's possibly. I don't know. Possibly less predation, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, um, on to Norway. A little more on Norway rats. They are not great climbers compared to the roof rat. They have ultrasonic calls, just like the, the house mouse does. Somebody actually checked what they like to eat versus what they didn't like to eat that humans might provide. And their preferred foods were mac and cheese, cooked corn, scrambled eggs. And their least favorite were peaches, raw beets, and raw celery. So there you go. Now you know. <laughs> and England once did a, a census that discovered they had 1.3 1, 1 Norway rats for every person in England. And I believe that was a huge underestimate. But I don't know for sure. Okay. So here's the roof rat. And it's a smaller and more discreet and kind of cuter rat, if you will. And this one, um, again, was thought to have originated kind of in Southeast Asia and thought to have been in prehistoric Europe, but then disappeared in the Ice Age and then came back again uh, later on. But, um, but, but again, it's, it's circulated all over the world now, which is, which is not so good. They are fruit and nut eaters as a preference, but they will eat, just like the Norway rat, almost anything. But this is one big difference. They are incredibly good climbers. And they had discovered that nesting birds are a great source of food for them in terms of the eggs. And so this has been an issue with both roof rats and crows as we have reduced the number of nesting sites for some of our migrating songbirds. We, in essence, are concentrating them. And that's concentrating then a, a, a feeding base for a predator like the roof rat or the, uh, the corvids, the crows. So crows and ravens. So that's an interesting dynamic that's playing out. The roof rats are non-native. The crows are native. Uh, um, anyway, they also are disease vectors. Interesting thing about the black rat or roof rat is that we see them in the west and the southeast, but they're not in Detroit. They're not in upstate New York because they do not like the cold areas like the Norway rat can handle. And they're much more rural than Norway rats. You'll see them. These are the ones more likely to be seen in the barn in my county than the uh, Norway rats, although we will get Norway rats in there as well. So anyway, they, and they, there are some native landscape materials that can damage. This is the native pack rat, the bushy-tailed wood rat. And as you go into the Cascades, there also is a wood rat that does not have a bushy tail. But this is the one that's common in our county. And it will build nests and houses and outbuildings. I kind of like this one a little bit. Um, but I did have it end up in our house one time. I don't know how it got in. And I ended up, not unknowingly, because I didn't know what I was dealing with, ended up trapping it, a kill trap. And um, I, I was a little saddened that I'd done it, but not so much. 
but uh, it will actually collect shiny objects and all sorts of things from houses and then take it into a place and, and store it for later later use. So how many of you, any of you have seen this at all? Has, this, has it been, any of you seen this in, in Cowles County, the species? I know you have it. Okay, maybe not. not. California, I Interesting, I get quite a few calls from Yamhill County and Yamhill County is an interesting place because it has not only a lot of wine, but it has some of the last large remnant oak forest, and that may be part of what's going on there. Um, but I've had, well, I've had a lot of the calls coming in with pictures of these things from, from they've been relayed from, from um, Yamhill County to me by the extension office there because uh, I, I teach this class down there as well. So anyway, yeah, anyway, so wood rats, if they're in the house, you probably do need to get rid of them. So looking at the field ID issues with uh, Norway rats and roof rats, with the roof rat, the tail is longer than the body, and it's got kind of a pointed nose and, and kind of bigger ears compared to the uh, Norway rat. So the roof rat, bigger ears, pointed nose, longer tail than body. And then the Norway rat, bigger body than tail, tinier ears, and tinier eyes. So that's, and then more of a blunt face. And then if you look at a young roof rat, and a young mouse, they get pretty similar. That's where you can sometimes make a mistake. But where you won't make a mistake, generally, is when you look at the droppings. And so the, um, the uh, Noru rat has typically rounded end droppings that are pretty darn large, three quarters of an inch or so. The roof rat, about a half an inch droppings with a pointed end. And then the house mouse, much smaller, a quarter of an inch. and somewhat pointed ends usually that you can you can see but there's quite a difference between these droppings as you get to looking so that will give you some idea of what you're potentially dealing with so rat olympics they can get through a half an inch opening and what is sort of devastating about these rats are that they can enlarge an existing opening because they have uh, their rodent teeth or tough teeth and they can they can change the size of that opening to provide easier access for them. And they do they do make their own holes. They can make their own holes for sure. They can climb the insides of pipes that are an inch and a half to four inches in diameter. So they can get inside those pipes like a, like a drain pipe and just go up them. They can climb the outside pipes if they're three inches or less in, in diameter. And they can climb the outside of any pipe if it's near a wall that they can just push against the wall and the pipe and go up. And that's not encouraging, is it, in terms of being able to get around the places you don't want them to be. They can definitely crawl across, um, I didn't put this in, but they can crawl across uh, electrical wires or cable wires or those kinds of things, so that's not good. They can jump vertically 36 inches, and you say, well, three feet, that's not so, you know, that's okay. They can jump horizontally 48 inches, so 36 feet, or 36 inches, 48 inches, not so bad. But here's where it gets interesting. They can jump horizontally eight feet if they're 15 feet up. And if they miss, they can drop 50 feet without injury. Now that is an animal that has evolved to be in structures that we have built. This is a city animal. This is a city construction, if you will, a city evolution of a species that probably was much less capable before it decided that making its case with humans was a big deal. They can have burrows four feet under the ground, and they can swim a half a mile in open water, and they can come up through broken pipes and houses into people's toilets. And that does happen to people, and it happened to my, my, uh, my mother late in her life, and it was one of the most um, terrifying experiences I think she has ever had, she ever had. Um, it was, it was not, not friendly. So, um, yeah, those are broken sewer pipes, and it's just amazing. They will do that. So... Still more, they have some odd eyesight. They have semi-independent eye movements, so they don't have to be looking in the same place, but they can be, they're very wary, and they can look in, in semi-separate directions. And then they have an incredible sense of smelling, hearing, touch, and balance. So they've got a real package of, of things that they can do, do well. And rat reproduction is part of Rat Olympics, too. They mature in five weeks, peak breeding in the spring and fall. 
The female comes into estrus every three days until bred, which is she's going to get bred. You can count on that. And there's generally five to 12 young. And the young are born 21 to 23 days after breeding. That's, that's, that's pretty fast. And unlike most mammals, uh, a female rat who's nursing doesn't shut off her ability to rebreed. She can rebreed within three days of giving birth. So I don't think that's, well, I know that that's not common, but it's also known to be possible and that it does occur. So there you go. So I really do believe that raising rats is a communal experience, that uh, they don't tend to stay completely in one space. And when we're talking about rat problems, we're really talking about sources of feed, sources of cover, and then how do we deal with the existing population. So that's kind of the, the big deal. Looking to describe what you have, when people see a hole like this, they're desperate to think that it's anything but a rat. But typically, it's a rat. Uh, a few times it can be a ground squirrel. It could be, in rare circumstances, that mountain beaver. Um, if, if you're right adjacent to a forest, they'll sometimes make a, a tunnel that looks something like that. But typically, these will connect the shallow runways and multiple openings in different places. So. Um, one of the tricks is to remove cover for rats because they do like the protection of both the ground. But ivy and junipers have been notorious for being good covers for rats. And any any other ground cover that's kind of bulky, in other words, there's there's you know a fair space and there's space underneath it, is a place that rats can be be very comfortable being in. So debris piles, structures, those kinds of things, underneath. Uh, structures. Yeah. So this is just the perfect opportunity for rats. There's cover, there's food. Um, what's, what's not to like? So in Portland especially, they got into a big composting and chicken binge about, well, about the time of the last recession. And it was all well and good until the rat population exploded with both composting and the backyard chickens. And people began to have to look more and more in detail about what they were doing and how they were doing some of these things and making sure that the chicken feeders they had, that the chickens were taking up all the feed or if they were leaving some overnight, they had the kind of feeder that could hang and the rats couldn't really get into very easily. So, uh, and those are, those are not, those are challenging feeders to, to find that really work. But anyway, um, in compost bins, there's become an understanding in the urban areas, if you're going to do this right and keep the rats out, you're going to have to have something like a big ex piece of expanded metal or concrete underneath that, underneath that compost bin, because otherwise they are going to get in, and they still may on these plastic ones gnaw through them, but, um, but they definitely can be a problem. So um, I was given one of these R2-D2s some years ago by somebody who had gotten them in Portland and moved out here and didn't want them, want them anymore. And so I put one up, and I didn't put a bottom on it. And the first couple of years, I did find some, some voles that were nesting in that. And... Uh, one time I, uh, yeah, voles mainly, voles mainly were what were in there. And then all of a sudden it turned out or turned into a snake incubator. And that is what it's been ever since. Uh, so I put stuff in there and the snakes show up and in the winter, you know, end of winter when I'm taking it out to use it in the garden, um, I start putting new stuff in and the snakes start showing up. You can see a snake there, you can see a snake there. And I'll open the cover and they're not used to me. I mean, they still kind of move around sometimes, and sometimes they, they don't pay any attention. So it's not something that everyone's comfortable with, but, um, but I found it kind of interesting so far. So anyway, rats can gnaw and make their own holes, make their own adventure. So typically, if you find an existing hole, metal and steel wood is, is at least a potential barrier to entrance. And so... Sometimes people do things like put in a heat pump or something like that and go through an existing mesh kind of connection on their foundation to put the heat pump system in, and they don't really put steel wool around that piping. 
and that is important to keep stuff out of your of your area. It can be a major thing. So anyway, we do get rats gnawing the wiring, and that can cause fires if they short, which is a, a serious deal. So do mice and squirrels. So all three of them are, are issues for us if they're in houses. And this was a rat that made a big mistake in a panel and got electrocuted. So anyway, in terms of control, uh, exclusion, as I've talked about already quite a bit, is by far the best bet. Any holes that you can you can tighten up is are, are super important. Yeah, and there's the kind of thing that, you know, it was created after the fact and this needs steel wool right in here. And it will it will do a fair, fairly good job of stopping. What I suggest to people have a standard foundation and there's enough room to get underneath it, um, to go underneath it and look to see where you can see light and and see whether there's a covering, a, a, an intact covering for light. It's amazing how many foundation vents, and it seemed to have been a style maybe 40 or 50 years ago to have it have some tight mesh that went from the bottom up on the front, on the on the vent, but then was just bent over on the inside and not attached. And and uh, rats can definitely push through that. So um, you just want to look and and see if you can how they're getting in. One of the great virtues of daylight basements are that it's very difficult to mop for a rat or a mouse to enter the house from the foundation with a daylight basement. So, so then we get to how do we control and why would we control them. I prefer trapping. Basically then you have the body. If you're going to bait, you're inevitably going to end up with dead rats in your wall void or somewhere you can't get to and they are going to smell and they're going to smell horribly for a period of time and you don't want that. And so I prefer trapping. But I think what you need to do after having spent quite a few t years talking to people about this and, and watching their experiments and listening to their, their discussions and, and thinking together with them, I'm convinced that if you think you have rats in your house, if you've seen them enough that you know you have them, you have quite a few. And because they're smart, you're never going to catch them all with one technique. So you're going to work on taking away the food, which is going to make them anxious and a little more reckless. You're going to look at beginning to exclude, even though that may mean trapping some inside. And then you're going to buy for wherever you think you can get to the rats, where they are, you're going to buy 10 to 15 of these big rat traps, and you're going to put them out for two or three days or more, and you're going to look at them, and you're going to put, you're not going to set them, and you're going to put peanut butter on them, and you're going to get them used to eating them. And then on the fourth or fifth day, the day of carnage, you're going to set them all. And you're going to get as many of the rats as you're going to get, except for the occasional stupid or really young one. So... I think this works as a beginning tool or technique. It might, if you have just the beginnings of a rat infestation, it might actually clear it up completely, but I wouldn't count on it. Another technique involved in some of this would be to drill the edges of these wooden traps with a hole and then wire, to it, wire them to eye bolts if you're trapping in an attic that you can get to. So anyway, but this is the deal. You've got to get as many rats as you can at once because they're really smart and you're not liable to get them the same way after this. So, so after, well, another trapper, a trapping system that I have come to believe is quite effective is something called the rat zapper. And I don't know if any of you use this, but it, it uses some D-cell batteries, and um, the rat goes inside one rat at a time, and it electrocutes the rat. And you dump it out, and you put, you know, turn it back on again, and put it out. And I talked to, I first heard about this maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and I was talking to a woman in a class I was teaching in Lake Oswego on, on, on the subject, and she said, this is what I used, and I caught 12, not 12 rats in two or three days, which to me was interesting because it meant the rats didn't get used to this. They didn't see what was happening. They didn't get it. And... Um, so I've since begun to recommend these to people, 
I've heard a few people say for them they didn't work. I'm not sure why. I've never been able to figure out why they didn't work. But I've heard from quite a few people they do work. So it is something that if you have a rat problem, I would suggest you employ as part of the arsenal because, again, you want the body if you can. You want to avoid having to move to the baiting solution, which ends up being much more complicated. So anyway, I don't know. Has anyone here used the rat zapper? Yes, no? I have a I used it. Yes, good or bad? Yes. Um, it worked really well for us. Um, I think at first we were a little disappointed because nothing happened, but we must have been right in the middle of a gestation period because within a 48-hour period, we caught 8 to 12 rats. And there you go. Ours has a little light and a buzzer that beeps when there's something in there. Um, so you can tell when it's... Uh, occupied and dispose of it immediately. Right, right, right. You know, what may have happened, rat, rats are really smart. They have, may have spent two days trying to figure out whether it was safe or not. And then they figured out it was safe, but they couldn't see that the rat that went in there wasn't coming out. <laughs> and so I, it, it, it's a breakdown in their capacity to think this thing through, I think. It's really interesting to me how, how this thing does seem to work. And I, agree, I do agree with you. You do need to be patient with it. That's Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to uh, baiting. Um, as we talked about, you run the issues with them dying in the wall voids or under the house or wherever in the attic. There's issues of non-target injury. Rats and mice both will store baits. In other words, they'll not consume everything they take. And when they store the bait, it can be in a, you, you might be putting it in a place that's safe to start with, but it might be ending up in a place that might not be so safe. And you will not know necessarily where they, you won't know where they put it. I mean, I have a personal example of that. We one time years ago had, had a few mice in the attic, some deer mice in the attic. And I decided, well, I'm not going to trap these because I hadn't, I hadn't really experienced deer mice very much. And so I just put out some bait and it did solve the problem. But 10 years later, I was taking out an old stereo system to take to Goodwill, and it was dropping rat bait out of the stereo system. And we'd put that stereo system up there, and portable stereo system, and it had been there for all that time while I had, you know, that, that brief period of time I was baiting. But the mouse had chosen to stash bait there, and it was dribbling out in the ground as I was taking it away. So you got to understand with these baits, they aren't, they aren't, um, you got to be careful how you use them, for sure. Follow all the instructions. So you can build bait stations or buy bait stations that are effective. Typically, if they're inside, you should be able to put them in places where dogs or cats can't get to them. I will say that I'm fairly convinced that rats become bait shy to certain baits, so switching off the baits periodically is important. Um, I think it does make a difference. Any questions about rats? That's kind of the end of the discussion on rats. Hopefully the baits solve what you haven't been able to solve by other means. But, you know, start with, start with never getting a rat problem by really making sure you don't have any entryways. Start by making sure you're not feeding the rats around your property accidentally. You know, bird seed or cat food or dog food outside, free choice. You know, you want to avoid that as much as you can. Just give the birds what they can eat in a day. And um, and beyond that, you know, tighten your house up. That's Those are the starting points. So, anyway. Okay, uh, here's our native Douglas tree squirrel, which I think are kind of cute. And they're definitely chatterboxes of the first order. And they have many opinions, which they, they aren't, aren't shy of sharing. But... But um, by and large, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable being around them. So far, they've never tried to come into our house. They are, we have on one side quite a bit of forest, and, and they're definitely there, but I, I've really not felt them to be a problem inside our house. But some people have had them come inside houses and uh, cause more problems. Um, there's another picture of them. This is our western gray squirrel, which is actually disappearing as we're losing our oak forests in, in western Oregon, western Washington. And it's a fairly big honking squirrel, um, but is, is increasingly uncommon. I think the eastern gray squirrel is the one Longview has so much of. Isn't that the case? I'm pretty sure that's what I've heard, is, is the eastern gray squirrel. Anyway, right. um, 
the eastern gray squirrel is very urban adapted compared to the western gray squirrel. So um, the landscape issues are modest. You know, pulling down, pulling off bark, often in strips. Um, and this is this is some squirrel gnawing and squirrel gnawing. So you get strip pulling, and then you get uh, horizontal gnawing, and this is actually ground squirrel gnawing and bark pulling. So that I've seen. So, but this is what you want to avoid. Like with rats, you want to avoid openings that are available to them. But unfortunately, just like rats, squirrels can gnaw their way in, and squirrels can be really challenging because they can move so easily in the tree systems and in the wires. We, we had a squirrel um, about two years ago that became famous with Comcast because it was working about a mile and a half stretch, and it was going through the Comcast lines about every 10 days, and for no apparent reason other than they had a grudge, apparently. And they were having to come out and deal with us all the time, and I guess they finally caught the squirrel, but it took an enormous amount of time to do it, an enormous amount of money to uh, figure out uh, how, how well, to keep, keep it fixed and, and together. So anyway. So basically with squirrels, I'll not say anything else uh, other than you don't want them and you don't want to feed them. I've got a story about that, but I don't think I'll tell that today. But you don't want to start feeding them because they can get very irritated if you stop. And um, they are active 24-7 in houses. They are fun, fun making machines in their view. They, they, they have a love of life and they can make all sorts of annoying noises and they can cause, bring diseases in, they can damage wiring, cause fires, all that. So you really want to keep squirrels out of your house. And if you think you, they're in your house and you don't, you're not sure about how to deal with them, you need to call somebody because it does need to be solved. Does anyone else have any, anyone have any questions about squirrels? I have a comment. Um, I have a problem with squirrels. Could I have you speak up I, a little bit, please. Excuse me. Oh, Could you speak up Any, a little bit, please. Okay, I have a comment. Um, I have just raised beds, and you know, flower beds, and I don't put down a bunch of landscape paper on the beds and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the squirrels here have access to a an English walnut tree, and a hazelnut tree that is not on my property. Um, but anyhow, I am constantly digging up hazelnut and walnut trees in my raised beds everywhere, everywhere. So uh, I'm not I'm not liking squirrels very much. Yeah. Oh, they'll do that. They'll do that. So we have we have three things doing that on our property. We have squirrels doing that. We have chipmunks doing that, and we have Stellar's jays doing that. All three are, are engaged in a process of. Um, putting together winter forage caches, and yeah, so it, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, we we actually we had an interesting squirrel problem in St. Helens one year, where it was in the post office actually, and there used to be a huge walnut tree there, and the squirrels really did use that walnut tree for almost a year-round food source because of what they collected at you know when they were harvesting and then what they ate all year, and they were in the in the attic of this old kind of strange building that was built in the 1930s that was the post office and they couldn't figure out how to get them out of it with the way that the thing was um, constructed. So finally they ended up doing some baiting and cutting down the walnut tree and that was that that, that was the end of the squirrel problem in, in, in there. So okay on to raccoons. Uh, uh, just another question Chip. Sure. Um, are raptors susceptible to secondary poisoning from rat, uh, rodent baits? They, they can be. Again, this is why the toxicology of the baits that are available now to people who aren't using them professionally has decreased to what we call the first generation anticoagulants. And so typically the worst potential toxicity to a, to a non-target raptor would happen if they got an animal with a lot of undigested bait contents in its, its stomach at the time that it got it. Um, and that could, that could, I, in fact, I once did ask our vet med school to do a calculation, you know, on a chihuahua versus a rat, you know, and if it had the bait, you know, and he said it would have to be a big rat 
a very small dog and a lot of undigested contents. And I don't know if, I don't think the raptors are in a dose response relationship any more affected, but since they're smaller species in, in a sense, have less body mass, there may be, there may, it may take less to do it. Obviously baits are a problem. Um, you know, you, this is why a lot of them aren't available to homeowners anymore because they were used in ways that they shouldn't have been used. And the farmers, uh, we have some baiting that goes on for voles in certain crops. And the uh, rules around baiting and the timing around things like, um, well, we've had some issues with Canada geese picking up some of the baits and things like that. There's some real pretty uh, strongly enforced uh, rules with regard to how those baits can be used in agricultural settings uh, to minimize that potential damage. I won't say it's perfect, but but um, but yeah, we we'd love to not have uh, we would love to not have to use baits. The problem is it, it would be nice if the rats had never gotten here, but we're past that point. So yeah, we in some points and yeah, some points are they're tough choices. Typically, t typically knock. Um, your 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 raptors are not feeding on on rats that have been baited because typically they're not they're not in those locations where you're dealing with rats unless they're in an area where the rats have gone feral. For example, there's a lot of roof rats in the uh, along the San Joaquin River, uh, and there's actually some interesting studies of their relationships to the to the uh, songbird nests up there uh, down in that location. There's a long term research projects going on on that. Anyway. Um, there would be an area if you were baiting the rats, you would probably be running the risk, a higher risk, potentially of of affecting the, the raptor population. Yeah, so it's a good question for sure. Um, in terms of raccoons, don't ever start feeding them. Don't be leaving free feed outside. Just like some of the other species we've talked to, um, they're very adapted to human behavior. They tend to be nocturnal, but aren't absolutely so. They have a fairly high reproductive capacity, a fairly high litter number, all one litter a year. And they can vector a number of diseases. I talked about that um, roundworm, the Baliascarisk, earlier. And uh, rabies in the northern seaboard, uh, like in New York and Massachusetts, place like that, the raccoon is actually the major vector of rabies out there to the point where they've been giving raccoons rabies vaccinations through feed that they eat, they give them to eat, um, to try to reduce the spread of rabies into the human population from the raccoon populations that are out there. So, so raccoons, I mean, I think they're interesting. They're, they are darn cute. They're way too smart. Um, they can potentially hurt your pets. If you have a cat door, they can get into your house. And I've seen a house, a, house, a, a kitchen, trashed by a raccoon once, and um, they can dine from your garden compost bin, your hen house, your koi pond. We had one very famous story in Portland by a writer who, uh, he was a, a columnist in the Portland Oregonian, and he knew um, a couple that had gone to, they, they, had, they had quite a bit of money, and they'd gone and bought $10,000 of very fancy koi in Japan, in Japan and brought them back and put them into a koi pond, and they disappeared due to the raccoons within, I think it was 10 days, and he described it as the most expensive meal ever served in Portland as, um, as the conclusion of that story. So anyway, um, just, you know, they can climb your garden fences, so you can expect that they will be in almost your garden. Um, unless you put up an electric fence as a... a a part of your your fencing system, they will definitely get into your get into your garden with almost any fence you would put up. Uh, the solid wood fences are probably the least the most difficult for them to climb. Um, those, those would be more difficult for them. So, anyways, anyone have any other questions about raccoons or? Um, a lot of people in my county do live trap them and release them, and we talked a little bit about the challenges of doing that or not doing that. So, anyway, yeah. The only comment I have is raccoon love grape arbors. Oh, they do. They absolutely do. They love lots of things. Um, people have asked me about getting rid of raccoons that have nested under low, either under a foundation where there's opening, there's an opening, or 
underneath a very low deck. And I think there is some validity to the idea that you can soak some rags in ammonia and put them underneath there, and that will sometimes move them out. So I think it is worth looking into if, if you have that problem with either, with either uh, raccoons or skunks. So, I, I yes. think it's raccoons that killed my goose. Oh, I'm sure. I, 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 my chickens. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Raccoons are, are, they are omnivorous and smart. That's a bad combination. They ate the internal organs, but not the meat. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, on, on the goose. Okay. 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 Huh. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll take the best part, the most digestible part first. And that's, a, that's, a, that's in, in, the, in the animal world, those are the best. Um, this is just a sort of timeline of, of raccoons. So, yeah, try to, try to make sure they can't nest early in your place. So they do a small bit of good. Um, uh, we already talked about that. The, the only good, good that I know raccoons do in a, in a broad sense, other than being part of our ecosystem, which they probably do some other things, is that they are one of the predators of the European crane fly, along with skunks. And the larvae of the European crane fly are in lawns, and if you've ever had little divots pulled out of your lawn all over the place, it's either a skunk or a raccoon looking for European crane flies. And both skunks and raccoons and bear are, um, are fairly good at going after ground nesting yellow jackets and tearing those nests apart. So if you've ever seen one of those nests just thrown up onto the ground, it's either a skunk or a bear or a raccoon. And how the heck they manage not to get injured in the process is it must, those, those immature, you know, succulent little baby yellow jackets must be a, a high a protein value for them because they're, they're quite enthusiastic about doing them if they find them. So anyway, and then, yeah, so... Okay, I won't spend much time on skunks. I, I generally find they're generally beneficial. I, I think they're not nearly the problem raccoons are. They do spray if they're startled. We've had a fairly decent relationship with skunks around here for the most part. Um, I, I've got a longer story about the time my beagle spent two hours with a skunk. They both came out fine, but... Uh, I learned several things. Number one, that a beagle can bark about once a second for over over um, two hours. He took a couple of days off barking after that event, but he did that for two hours. I also learned that skunks can reload upwards of 30 times. So when this started to happen, I was outside and I was going to try. I tried to get them apart by squirting with a sprinkler and that had no, with, with a hose, and that had no impact whatsoever. So I decided we were just going to have to see how this worked out, and it worked out over two hours. The skunk finally got out, um, but the dog was, the dog was tired and definitely skunked. So how do you, well, how do you remove the odor from a skunk? This actually works, and I had just learned this technique not long before this event happened. And it was one quart of hydrogen peroxide, a quarter of a cup of baking soda, and a teaspoon or two of liquid dishwashing soap. Mix it together and work it into the fur. And it does work really well. You do not want to get it in their eyes, but otherwise uh, we could see no, um, no harmful effect whatsoever. And there was a little bit right above the eyes, right in the kind of the crown of his head there, that I didn't put any of this there. And we could still smell a whiff of skunk for at least two weeks after that there, but nowhere else on his body. So this formula does work. And it was developed by a, a Kodak chemist when he had some spare time trying to figure out. He knew that the, the chemical structure of the skunk smell was known. And so he just looked into his knowledge of chemistry and the way chemicals operate on each other and figured out something that would work. And it does. Actually, it works quite well. So... But if you ever get skunk smell in the insulation under your house, which is why you really want to make sure they don't get under your house if you have underfloor insulation, 
is that you're going to have to remove the insulation. You are not going to be able to ever get it out of that insulation, and it will smell for a long, long time. So, any skunk questions? Okay. Well, I, I smell a lot of skunk when I'm driving down to Redding, California, lower lower part where it's. I don't smell. I when I was a kid, I used to smell it around here a lot. I don't smell it anymore, hmm. but it it it's down there. We have a lot of skunks here. We we have a quite a, quite a large number of skunks here. Um, mostly the striped skunk, occasionally a spotted skunk, but yeah. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on possums. They were not native to this area, but they did come here uh, on a migration pattern that went through basically the southeastern United States and into California and then up into Oregon So, and, and Washington. So, again, it's the same as all, you know, with some of the other species like the raccoon, managing the feed, managing the cover, and does, it does make a difference. And definitely there's cyclic populations in possums. Uh, they were, their numbers were almost, they were almost non-existent for a period of time. And then I would say in the last five years, they're making a modest revival in this location. And I don't really know what, I don't know what drove that. There's some theory that the raccoons became more aggressive and actually outcompeted the skunks for the same territory as well as food. But, um, yeah, don't know for sure. Oh, there's the nutria. Okay, this was a horrible introduction. Um, they, are, they are purely plant eaters. They don't tend to be a household pest, but they're definitely a natural history pest because they destroy very, very valuable wetland plants. And if anyone's ever planning to do a wetland restoration, you want to make sure you have an initial nutrient control and you want to make sure, and, and especially if you're dealing with non-woody wetland plants, um, you want to have an initial nutrient control program and then you want to have a nutrient maintenance control program because they've taken down ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of plant material in two and three week periods of time. And so you just don't go into this with your eyes closed. If you're in if you're in a zone that has nutrient, we have nutrient all along our diking system along the Columbia River. Um, they don't go very far upstream mostly in Columbia County, but they they are definitely along the Columbia uh, in a lot of places. So you want to you want to make sure you, they are controllable, and you can kill a nutria at any time. Um, yeah, they're they're pretty tough looking creatures. They're big. They're big. They are completely vegetarian, but yeah. Okay, brief discussion on birds. Our biggest bird mistake was a starling. Somebody wanted to introduce all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare, and he did repeated introductions around Central Park in New York City, and slowly but surely they moved from Central Park to all everywhere in New York, and my mother was from upstate New York, a tiny little town, and we would go there for vacations or just trips to see the grandparents, and... Um, and the elms there, which aren't there anymore, but the elms were just full at, at that time of starlings um, in, the, uh, in the early 1960s, late 1950s. And they'd already populated that area by then. So, and then they slowly but surely moved west. And I think the, the common thinking is they became well established in western Oregon and western Washington in the late 60s, mid to late 60s to early 70s. Bad decision. Anyway. Uh, they're fruit eaters. Uh, they drop all sorts of loads of of um, droppings. They will they will prey on the eggs of native birds. So there's no love lost with them in terms of the Audubon Society. If somebody brings in an injured starling, they injure it further. They uh, they hate starlings. So and there's good reason to do that. Um, sadly, they are here. We're never going to be rid of them. I don't think they don't have. They're pretty smart. They're colonial. Um, they, their biggest problem for us in terms of commercial operations are they love fruit. And so they will go into, um, you know, berry plantings or raspberry plantings or they'll go into blueberry plantings or grape plantings. And, you know, unless you're willing to give up your planting completely, because you can have starling nesting colonies of over 10,000 birds. 
And we had one show into uh, in from uh, it was across from Rainier, actually right across from Longview, um, 15, 20 years ago, probably now. They had nested, unbeknownst to the grower of this very small little blueberry operation, downstream from him about a mile to a mile and a half. And then they came in and they found his blueberry farm that summer. And he normally was able to harvest 20 tons of blueberries off that, that small farm. And he ended up getting something like one ton of blueberries and basically ended up having to sell the farm. So these are serious issues agriculturally, especially with berry crops. So what can we do? Well, we can net. And netting is expensive and difficult to put on and challenging. Uh, we do it on grapes. Um, in some settings and that helps. We also can, oh, I'm going the wrong way here, uh, we also can use these cannons, there's different types of cannons, there's um, propane cannons and some others that they have to start at 5.30 in the morning and they have to be moved around otherwise the starlings get used to them and so uh, they're smart birds but one thing has happened recently that has really improved our luck with starlings in terms of starling control. And years ago, we actually used to have a spray that was repellent to them, but that got taken off the market, and so we don't have anything that we can just spray on the fruit anymore. Uh, so we have to have other control techniques. But the thing that has changed the equation are drones. And drones can be AI'd to actually chase the starlings and this is beginning to alter the dynamics for farmers raising grapes and blueberries and things like that with regard to starlings. So anyway, there's some optimism in, in the world on this. This is an ab alarm in a grape orchard, and this is basically designed to either have the sound of an injured starling put out into the, uh, into the field or the sounds of their predator birds, the, the raptor birds. So, yeah, it can be helpful. And these don't work. So... Um, I think I'll skip. Um, I think we talked a little bit about crows and row covers during the vegetable class. So the, the biggest thing I, I think I worry about with crows, um, I like crows and ravens a lot. So I, the, the row covers really solve the crow problems pretty much for me and for the gardeners that use it. So, and, um, I'm comfortable with woodpeckers hammering on the metal. It's all about sex and territory. And the only time that they try to nest in a house is if it's a really attractive location for them. Usually it's at the peak of a house. Usually in a house it's either cedar, cedar sided, cedar shingle sided, or there's some kinds of T111 they like. And sometimes right at that peak they will nest or try to make a nesting cavity. Because we've taken away a lot of their dead wood, which is too bad. But anyway, we, they'll try to make a nesting cavity, and uh, that's not the place to do it for most people. So I have found that putting up netting in front of the nesting cavity about a foot to a foot and a half tends to move them to somebody else's house. So that's what we've found in the people I've worked with on, on that. So anyway, um, and briefly on bats, even though it's not a bird, uh, we do have the little brown bat. It likes to come in especially around chimneys. And the little brown bat, to the best of our knowledge, most of them will migrate away from mid-November through early March. A lot of them appear to go into caves in or near the Cascades that are near 30 to 35 as a uniform temperature throughout the year. So they'll go there and then they'll come back. Uh, so if you're going to tighten the house up for bats, the time to do it is mid-November through, through uh, early March. So getting ready to do it right away. And bat boxes, you really can't get bats out of houses by putting up bat boxes very often. It's really a challenge to do. But having bat houses is a good thing in general. The things we've discovered in Western Oregon is that they need to be 11 or 12 feet or more above the ground and placed in the warmest possible spot. And those end up having more likelihood that they'll be occupied. If you can get access to some decently fresh bat guano and you can smear that around the bat house and inside the bat house, that may also encourage occupation. So anyway, I think that's it. So, and I think we're right about at the end.
Any, are you exhausted? No, it was great. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. This is, I, I enjoy these talks. I, it's, it's fun. It's very fun for me. Well, thank I like you. Discussion. But what's that? Other questions? No, but I just want to comment that it was a really good discussion okay. on I'll, a lot of topics. Oh. Thank you. I'll be back. Uh, I'm not sure when, but I will be back. So good. Yeah. If you have any questions at all, you can, um, Gary can give you my email, just as I, I think I offered it to you during the uh, vegetable class. You can email.